Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, Parallel Deku, back with another fanfiction. This is the first part of, What if Deku fell in love with Rumi? Now before starting, please give this video a like, and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Maruko the number 7 pro hero as of the last Japanese billboard normally watched the UA. Sports festival on recap after the fact, and only the third year stage. Like many other pros this year around however, she had chosen to attend the festival in person and watch the first year stage. So bored. She grumbled to herself, she nearly regretted her decision to attend the event, aside from the fact she had been given a great seat. Yue held her in high respect for all her work, and as she had decided to attend in person for the first time the school had given her the best seats they could offer. Set up high in the arena on the second level and far away from other viewers and pros. Maruko seemingly had a personal viewing box, seeing as the other five seats around her were empty. She grumbled to herself, bored, as she listened to present Mike Babel to the audience as the festival began in full swing. And now, the class everyone is looking at. They survived against their first taste of evil and now all eyes are on them. It's class 1A Maruko's left ear gave a small twitch finally interested in the events at Mike's call. As she watched the students make their way onto the field however, she grew disillusioned and let out a huff. They don't look like anything special. Faye, guess I should have just waited till it was over and watched the third years like normal. I'm already here though, might as well it up and watch, maybe some of them actually have guts. As the thought crossed her mind she let a smirk grace her features. She watched interested as Katsuki Bakugo took the stage and gave his pledge. As he did, she thumped her right foot slowly and disappoint once more at the first year stage. Arrogant bastard. Guess they're just kids after all. If you're going to declare war on everyone at least do it with gusto despite her shout as no one was around her Maruko spoke to silence as she huffed back into her seat and tapped her foot in irritation. She watched the contestants line up as Midnight declared the first event and Mike announced everything over the loudspeakers. Maruko sat up in her seat slightly interested to watch all the different quirks and the way the students used them to their advantage. Right off the bat she could tell that the two hero classes, 1A and 1B, were far ahead of the rest. Even amongst them 1A stood out and Shoto Todoroki seemed in a league of his own. The event dragged on and she watched interested at various uses of quirks in certain situations, but throughout she only took real interest once the undisputed first place had a shakeup. She watched intrigued as Katsuki fought against Shoto back and forth for the lead. Her eyes would have stayed there like most others, but for a reason beyond her understanding she looked back to the entrance of the minefield. When she did her head tilted slightly to the side and her long eyes laid somewhat flat against her head. Who's he? And what's he doing? She watched interested as Izuku dug at the ground, seemingly pulling up mines with a piece of robot metal. Once he had a good fifteen or so dug up and piled in front of him, she watched him step back and tilted her head the other way. He wouldn't. She thought with mirth as a small grin threatened to pull at her lips. Maruka was proven wrong as the next moment he surged forward and belly flopped, metal plate first onto the pile of mines. In a pink cloud of smoke, she sat up straight out of her seat and her leg thumped every second or so as she watched the completely unknown and plain boy rocket towards first place. Everyone else in the stadium was equally shocked by the sudden explosion, but she was one of the few who had been watching Izuku and knew what had caused it. Her foot began to pick up speed and thump faster as she watched him slow down and stall midair. What else you got and you show me some action, topple everyone else over. Most believed Maruko to be a crude and brash individual who only spoke her mind and admired the strong. While that was partially true, she saw it as speaking her mind truthfully. She hated hero teams because she had always seen them as crutches. She didn't believe that people couldn't be stronger together, but in her experience hero teams always ended up over relying on their teammates and letting their own strength wane. Maruko respected the strong because she knew she was strong, strength was earned and then once it was proven that strength created respect from those around them. People like Izuku, who seemed outwardly weak, but then proved everyone around them wrong were her favorite. After all that was how she had earned her place amongst the top 10 heroes. Being female in a mostly male environment, with an outwardly weak quirk made her work harder than all those around her who tried to prove her wrong. Come on kid show me something good, prove me wrong about your appearance. Maruko gave a silent plea for entertainment as she watched Izuku completely stall out in his rushed charge. Her eyes widened and her foot stopped as she watched him use his momentum to flip midair and strike the ground with the plate he'd been carrying. When another explosion occurred and not only pushed his two opponents out of the way but shot him straight over the minefield in one go and into first place Maruko's grin finally broke free. All three out of her sight Maruko leaned forward with everyone else eager to see who would emerge and claim first place. Yeah Maruko shouted out when Izuku was the first out and Mike shouted his name claiming first place in the qualifying events. Present Mike continued to spout out his comments and exclaim the ranks as they came in but Maruko's gaze was stuck rigid to Izuku. 1A, Izuku Midoriya, huh? I didn't even notice him before. He's got guts, I wonder what kind of quirk he's got, he didn't seem to do anything during the race. I'll have to keep his eye on him, he seems interesting. Maruko thought as she watched the boy seemingly gaze at someone in the audience and clench his fist in success. Once it was announced that he would be the sole bearer of 10 million points for the cavalry battle, she let out a small chuckle at his response as he locked up. 
with all eyes glaring at him for his points, she couldn't help but compare it to the pressure but on heroes like herself at the top. He gathered his strength quick and stood with his back straight looking for fellow teammates. Maruka watched almost amused as everyone he approached walked away in fear of his points. She gave a light snark towards Yue. In that regard, this is why teams are silly, he proved himself strong enough to bear those points, but now he has to work with others that aren't on his level. People are so afraid of those at the top that they can't even fathom standing on the same level. Soon after, Izuku did gather others around him though, and she couldn't help but chuckle at his choice of teammates. Takoyami she could understand as he seemed to have a good quirk and showed great control over it during the race. His choice of the support course student and fellow 1A student made little sense to her, however. Once the event began and he suddenly charged into the air on a jet pack, Maruko was again interested in the seemingly plain Izuku. Despite his looks she could feel a kindred spirit in his eyes, it was one that screamed of hidden strength and great determination. She watched other teams throughout the battle as well, but most of them were simple confrontations. Even most of Izuku's battles were spent running away, she was a bit angered by that, as she believed it was best to confront your enemies head on. At the same time, given his situation she couldn't refute it was the smart thing to do. After he was corned into a field of ice by Shoto the game became even more of a keep away. The remainder of the game battle turned out the same way, in the last moments though she started thumping her foot again at the shakeup. The front tank Shoto used, surged forward with his engine quirk. With the sudden surge of speed, she watched Izuku lose his 10 million, but at the same time even if instinctual his own arm surged out and grabbed a band from Shoto's neck. Now go get it back, come on, show tenacity don't freeze. Snapping the newly acquired band, he did just that. Without a moment's hesitation Izuku capitalized on Shoto's team's inability to move and charged back into the battle. In a sudden confrontation she watched the two teams face one another, as she gazed on her sharp eyes opened and her foot thumped hard as reddish pink veins seemed to crawl along his arm. Is that his quirk? What's it do? Maruka watched on with interest as her ears stood straight. Shoto had a fire flare up on his left side, but it was quickly put out as Izuku's arm surged forth and knocked it to the side as a burst of air shot out from his movement. In the distraction Izuku surged forth and grabbed another headband as she watched the shadow of Takoyami's quirk snatch the headband on Shoto's head. With the game over she had a slight huff that he hadn't managed to grab the 10 million and reclaimed first. Though with the three bands he snagged he managed to stay in the top four comfortably seated in third place. The winning teams were announced, and with them the placements of fights for the final event which would be a one-on-one -on -one tournament. As a fight order was provided a one-hour break for food was given. Maruko took the opportunity to head into the cafeteria, she wanted to grab some carrots, but she was also curious to see if she could find Izuku. He seemed to stick in her head, and she wanted to talk with him in person, to see what he was like for herself. In the provided lunch area, she hadn't spotted him anywhere as she waited in line. She had a small bundle of carrots held in one hand as she used the other to hold one carrot she slowly munched on as she looked around. Excuse me, Miss Maruko. She noticed the slight stutter coming from behind her, and when she turned to address it, she was met with none other than Izuku Midoriya. She could tell that he was a few inches taller than her, but with the way he was shaking and hunched into himself that difference seemed minimal. Well aren't you an interesting contradiction? You have a lot of power but you're shaking like a scared bunny. Maruko couldn't help but laugh at her own joke, the irony of calling him a bunny not lost on her. He's got guts, despite his shaking he actually approached me. None of the other cowards here who keep looking at me actually came up. She tilted her head slightly and looked over Izuku as she motioned with her now carrot-free hand for him to continue. Can you please sign this for me? Izuku stuttered out again as he bowed 90 degrees and presented an open book to her. She took the book and was intrigued to see it was open to a page about her. A full-body sketch of her in costume was on the first page, which she felt exaggerated her figure, was followed by several pages outlining information about her. From her most famous and infamous battles, to her quirk, its strengths, weaknesses, and even ideas he had on moves and improvements she could make to better fight. The book intrigued her as it was far more detailed and in-depth than she herself had really given credit to. She gestured for a pen and went back to the page with the sketch of her to sign below it. Does he really think I look like that? It's kind of flattering. She watched as Izuku bowed repeatedly and stuttered out thank you after thank you for her signature. After he collected himself, he was about to walk away, before she reached out a hand and placed it on his shoulder. Izuku stood frozen in place, not only from her raw strength which stopped him from moving, but also, the fact that a girl was touching him. You intrigued me a bit Midoriya, I'm curious what exactly is your quirk, it seems strong. Also, you seem like quite a coward, why, if you have such a great quirk Maruko felt she might have been too blunt for the boy when he turned to bright red and started babbling. She was about to give up on finding him interesting before something changed in his eyes. 
he suddenly stood back straight, displaying that there was indeed a difference in height between the two as he spoke slowly and with a deep power. For most of my life I thought I was quirkless, I always admired everyone else around me who had such great powers. It wasn't until very recently that I discovered my quirk, it's so strong that the physical backlash breaks my bones if I don't use it carefully. Only once I had trained my body enough in my attempt to take the UA. Entrance exam did it manifest. I only just recently got slight control over this power, but even then I still want to be a great hero. My goal is to prove everyone who told me I couldn't wrong and prove everyone who believed in me right. Izuku internally screamed to himself questioning why he had told her all that, but the thought stopped when she reached out and started to poke and prod at his various muscles. The baggy clothes hide it, but he is pretty stacked. If his quirk really has that much backlash it would make sense why it didn't appear until his body could handle it. Not the first late bloomer quirk I've heard of, still if he has that power he really should grow a backbone. Maruko looked at Izuku and he was once more a blushing and stuttering mess from her prodding. I'll be waiting for that moment then Midoriya. Show me something good. She gave Izuku his book back with her signature as she walked back towards her seat for the coming events. As she tossed a look over her shoulder she once more saw that resolve that intrigued her in his eyes as he promised he would. Once Maruko was back in her seat, she happily munched away at her carrots, glad she had gotten her chance to talk with Izuku. He wasn't what she had been expecting in the slightest, but that just intrigued her more. From what he had said she gathered he didn't have the greatest childhood, believing himself quirkless. To her that explained his shy behavior, but he also could switch and have that undying fire as his eyes that reminded Maruko of herself. Their goals were very similar as well, she wanted to be a hero to save lives and improve the world in her own way. But she also, like Izuku wanted to prove to everyone that had doubted her and her quirk that they were wrong. A small snort of amusement came out as she finished off her last carrot. She couldn't help but find in her own way a kindred spirit in Izuku Midoriya once more. Before she noticed it the tournament was once more in full swing and Izuku was up first against Shinso from general studies that she had paid no mind to. That changed and her demeanor grew sour at the seeming loss for Izuku as he turned around and began walking out of the stage. She could tell that it started after he talked to the other boy and deduced it was something to do with his quirk. Her attitude did a quick turnaround as Izuku's fingers suddenly had the same reddish veins from the cavalry battle. In the next moment a gust of air strong enough to push her back into her seat bust forth and Izuku stopped moving. She looked down with keen eyes and noticed two of his fingers were a blackish blue. Damn guess he wasn't kidding about some serious backlash. Still takes guts to use your power and fight knowing you're going to break bones. You showed me something interesting again, now win. Maruko cheered in her head as Izuku charged at Shinso, with a quick turnaround and shoulder throw he was declared the winner. The matches that followed were each in their own way intriguing, but Maruko couldn't find anywhere near as much interest in them as she did Izuku. Fight after fight came and went, but then the second round began and she watched as Izuku stepped out. He still had that deep routed determination, but it seemed to be blocked behind something else. Izuku Midoriya was many things, but most would never consider him unintelligent. The only thought he could process as he gazed across the arena of the UA. Sports festival was the exact opposite. He had thought over and over of different scenarios or ways to go about what he wanted to do, but he couldn't. I want to help him, no, I have to help him. Todoroki can't go on thinking about his power the way he does and still win, it's not right. Everyone else is giving everything they have to win and he's only half trying, it's just not right. Izuku kept going over his thoughts again and again, but they kept circling back to one answer. I'll force him to use his fire, then once he's at his strongest I need to defeat him beyond a doubt. He needs to accept his power and see how far he can still rise. Despite his desire to win and defeat Shoto however, Izuku couldn't stop one singular thought beyond whining. How can I beat him when I don't know how strong he is, or what his limits are? Think Izuku, think, there must be some trick. Something I can do to beat him and win. Quirks are still just physical attributes he must have some limit. He took a deep breath and stared across at his opponent with a deep resolve. If you want to give up now, before you break anything else, this will be your last chance Midoriya. Todoroki said with a harsh glare. Izuku gave a brief shake of his head tossing about his curly green hair before he strengthened himself and glared back. I won't go easy on you either Todoroki, I will defeat you and win. Izuku decided that nothing but his strongest attack right off the bat would work. He had no idea how many, or how quickly, Shoto could attack with his ice. His fire was also a completely unknown factor, and Izuku didn't know how he would combat it. From the side of the arena Midnight sauntered up to her mini-podium stand and cracked her hand whip in the air. The whip made a resounding crack throughout the air as she asked both opponents if they were ready as Cementos took his seat on his self-made throne. When both nodded with a resounding yes Midnight gave her whip another resounding crack as she shouted to all watching in the stadium with anticipation. Start. Shoto quickly stomped down with his right foot and a small glacier of ice rushed toward Izuku. In retaliation, he quickly charged 100% of one for Alinto his right index finger and fed it with all his strength at the ice. With a surge of wind pressure and a silent smash in his head Izuku blasted the ice and Shoto back several feet. Seven more. Izuku thought as he watched Shoto stop himself from flying too far back or out of the ring. Shoto had quickly thrown a block of ice behind himself that almost resembled a flower or half a star to stop his momentum. 
He's ready to break himself to win, as I thought. It was better to not use everything I had in one go. Shoto shot a lidded glare at Izuku as he gathered his strength to get back up before he fired off more ice. He quickly braced against the attack again as it blasted him backwards a few feet closer to the edge again. Six left. I have to think of something else quick if I don't want this to be over immediately. Izuku thought as he clenched his teeth against the pain he was feeling. He looked up and noticed that just before Shoto shot his next volley of ice that we exhaled a large cloud of frosted breath. As the ice came at him again Izuku sacrificed his third finger to blast the ice back observing everything he could about Shoto. Only five more, what's the trick damn it? There has to be something. Why was his breath cold Izuku watched as Shoto continued his assault of ice unrelenting. With his pinky finger shot off Izuku had used the rest of his right hand and grunted briefly in pain. Before long his adrenaline kicked in and he watched Shoto charge towards him in his brief intermission of thought. Izuku hadn't watched and admired heroes all his life for nothing, however. He took every chance he could to admire quirks, their strengths, their weaknesses, ways to improve them, anything and everything. All this knowledge flooded him as he watched Shoto use his ice to shoot himself into the air coming down for a kick to end the fight. His breath was exhaled in a large cloud of frost once more as Izuku followed his every movement including the slight chip of ice on his shoulder. As he came down from overhead prepared to give a dropkick, Izuku also picked up on the minute shiver his body gave off. Is it how it is? Damn it. He's slower than before physically and his ice is also coming at a reduced pace. Damn it I can't win against that as I am, it only makes me even angrier that he doesn't use his fire. All his weaknesses as he is presently could be fixed if he just used his fire. I'm so angry but I can't do anything against him as I am. Think, think, something, anything, what can I do as I am now? What would all might do Izuku pondered deeply as Shoto came closer almost in slow motion. As he descended Izuku continued to think of everything he knew to find a way to win against Shoto. Attack, I would need a whole arm with how close he is. I can't chance it that he won't be blown off, he still hasn't used his fire either. Run, could I jump far enough away without one for all to make a difference before he attacked again what would all might do in that moment as Shoto descended in almost slow motion to Izuku. A thought of what he said to Endeavor only a few minutes prior flashed across his mind. I'm not all might, and Todoroki isn't you. That's right, I'm not all might. He chose me, it's my quirk. Run, attack I'll do both with the most I can without breaking myself. It won't break, it won't, it won't, I won't let it. Izuku with a rush of clarity pushed all for one into his arm and leg at the same time as he fiercely met Shoto's descending gaze. With a push against the ground from his right leg using 5% of one for all, Izuku was in front of Shoto before he could complete his overhead attack. His left arm pulled back to his waist. Izuku continued his internal mantra repeatedly as he surged his fist forward and her punched Shoto in his gut. In the same moment, despite his countered attack Shoto shot out his own attack and froze Izuku's unguarded right arm. As the two opponents separated from one another they each gave a slight tumble as they regained their balance to stand up straight. Izuku panted as he quickly examined his arm and leg, noting with joy that nothing was broken. He used the distance created to power his left arm again and shatter the ice on his right arm that covered from his lower shoulder to elbow. The heck was that Midoriya, you stop breaking all of a sudden present Mike shouted from his announcer's booth. The audience seemed to agree with the sudden change in the fight as the first real exchange began. He says that, but it's still patchwork at best. I can't fight like this very well, or for long. The transition between limbs is too slow. I might have pushed one for all into both limbs, but it was slow, I almost didn't make it. Izuku continued to think along those lines as he dodged Shoto's next ice attack by a hair as he pushed his legs with 5% one for all. He watched and continued to analyze Shoto as he slowed, and more ice accumulated on his right side. What drives you damn it? Why are you trying so hard Shoto practically shouted out to Izuku as his rage built unable to win as quickly as he wanted. Izuku returned his gaze with one of equal passion. I want to be the greatest hero, one who saves everyone with a smile. Just like All Might, but this fight isn't about that. You're not taking me seriously and wasting your own potential Todoroki, and it pisses me off. Why won't you use your fire Izuku seat that Shoto truly angry for one of the first times in his life? Did my shitty old man pay you off, I already told you I'll never use his power in a fight. Shoto fired back in even greater rage, angered at the mere thought of his father blackmailing or coercing someone into having him use his fire. Izuku ignored his comment as he looked at Shoto with steel in his eyes that seemed to glow green. You're shivering Todoroki, and that's what makes me so angry. You could fix that in an instant with your fire, but you hold yourself back and still think you can win with only half your power. Everyone else is here giving it their all to win, and you're only half trying that's just not right, I'll win and defeat you. Shoto looked down in rage for that moment, but that was all it took for Izuku to capitalize on his weakness. He charged forth one for all coursing through one leg again as he punched Shoto straight in his face. A gap between them was closed in an instant as Izuku's left cross connected with Shoto's face. He could do nothing but tumble backwards and block his back with ice as his head shook from Izuku's punch. What's wrong with you? Fight back. Come at me with everything you have Todoroki. Use your fire, you still haven't even scratched me yourself. Izuku shouted in rage at his classmate weakening his power deliberately and not fighting with everything he had. Let me save you, you stubborn person, you're almost worse than Kakan. 
Hizuku fumed internally as he watched Shoto seethe with utter rage as his comment riled him up. I told you I'll never use his power while. It's your power, damn it. Yours, not his. I'm fighting you right now, Shoto Todoroki. Not endeavor, Izuku interrupted Shoto and shouted out his own rage. As he said his peace of mind, Shoto seemed to freeze in place for several moments. Before the next instance, fire suddenly exploded out of his right side, superheating everything around him and defrosting his right side. Hot, hot, hot. It's hot. The fire's here. What's with this heat man? Mike continued his ever-present commentary as Endeavor strode from his place in the audience. Shadowu, have you finally accepted yourself? Yes, become my masterpiece. Fight, win, you were born to surpass me. Shoto ignored him as he gazed at Izuku across from him, right hands, fingers broken, and biceps slightly frostbitten with a wide smile present. Why are you smiling? Damn it, I thought you wanted to win. Don't blame me for what happens after this is over. I want to be a hero too, Shoto shouted out as he released all his fire and ice at the same time. Midnight and Semenos tried to stop the two combatants, but the force being generated was enough to push them back from stopping the fight quick enough. Izuku stared down Shoto as he watched the ice and fire dance around each other in an almost ethereal whirlwind. He crouched down in preparation for the coming attack as his brain for the first time in their fight stopped working. What do I do? I know I said I would make him use his fire and then win, but I don't know how I can. What can I do? I want to win, but I can't think of anything. I'm switching one for all on and off quicker between my limbs, but it's not fast enough. Oh, it's a switch? That's not right. Just as the thought came to him, the world all around Izuku went black and eight distinctly more defined shadows appeared before him. Unlike his fight with Shinso previously, the figures weren't just blurry outlines and floating eyes. This time his vision was much clearer. The figures had distinct shadows that defined their differences and their eyes shined with deep routed power. Not yet. The voices all mixed into one jumbled voice, but Izuku could also make out one distinctly soft and male voice as one of the shadow's hands reached out in a gesture of giving. Izuku slowly raised his hand and placed it in the shadows, almost like a helping hand up, as he did the world bled back into focus and the power of one for all surged through his whole body. All Izuku's senses felt like they were hyper-focused as one for all surged throughout his entire body. It felt like adrenaline and lighting was arcing through his entire body, almost in sync with that thought was a surge of green energy swirling around his body. For the moment it touched his skin Izuku noted it wasn't quite lightning, but almost like a physical manifestation of output energy. I'm not sure if I can even move like this, but this feels right. Almost like this is how one for all was meant to be used. If it's like this, then with everything I know and can do right now, I will win. Izuku moved far faster than he ever had previously as Midnight and Cementos tried to stop the coming collision. They were not fast enough as Shoto raised his flaming right hand superheating all the rapidly cooled air to create an explosion of pressure. When he noticed Izuku was less than a few feet away he also threw up a protective barrier of ice in front of him behind himself. Before his vision was blocked however, he noticed that aside from the new green lighting, Izuku's entire left arm was covered in his normal reddish veins. The cameras and entire audience were blind as in one loud explosion of force the fiercest collision of the festival yet occurred. Off to the sides of the stage midnight and Cementos grumbled about the strength of children as they attempted to take in the carnage. The entirety of the stage was cratered and destroyed in most places while covered in a plume of smoke. No other noise was being made as the smoke attempted to clear itself, but it was clear whatever the result may be the match was over. Mike meanwhile commented about the scary nature of Aizawa's students. Maruko was standing from her seat and had her hands clamped onto the railing in excitement from the clash and anticipation of the winner. Smoke seemed to clear slowly as the two boys' outlines became visible. While it wasn't obvious who each shadow was, one was clearly still in the arena and standing, and the other was slumped against a wall outside the stage. All the viewers held their breath and leaned forward as the smoke cleared. Arga bellow of utter victory rang out from the stage as the smoke cleared and revealed the image of a standing man. His right pant leg missing just above the knee, shirt completely gone and upper body slightly smoking with more than just sweat was Izuku. From out of nowhere with the underdog victory, it's Izuku Midoriya. He defeats the expected winner and slots himself into the semifinals. What else will this crazy kid show us today present Mike shouted out to all listening his own surprise at the standing boy. Izuku's upper body was slightly pink as though he had a mild sunburn and was steaming. Also, on top of his previous injuries his entire left arm all the way up to his shoulder was the same blackish blue color as his fingers on his right hand. Despite the injuries, he was standing on his own power and still conscious. Much to his embarrassment several cat calls and wolf whistles were being thrown at him. I was right, he stacked. Just shows how much effort he really put in to get where he is. That strength earned and respected. Maruko couldn't help the wide smirk that graced her face as she threw out her own compliments on the victory. Izuku couldn't believe himself that he had managed to do what he set out to, but he also felt a swelling of pride in the base of his gut. He had done it, he had defeated Shoto Todoroki at his best while making him use his fire. Not only that, but he had made several personal revelations about his own power during their fight. Izuku hadn't just helped Shoto, Shoto had also helped him, by being pushed to his absolute limit of what he could do Izuku had progressed forward just as much. One step forward led to a slight stagger, but Izuku was able to push through the pain and ignore the slight aching from his newly formed move. 
The audience watched on in silence as he made his way over to the unconscious Shoto. Midnight moved to stop him when he reached out with the broken fingers of his right hand, but she felt no ill intent. In a show of strength and good sportsmanship, Izuku griped the still intact right side of Shoto's shirt and grit his teeth through the pain. He clenched his fingers into a fist and used his strength to throw Shoto over his undamaged upper right arm and stagger both towards Recovery Girl. Midnight clenched her chest and swayed her hips with a cry about the joys of youth as Izuku grunted from his effort. As injuries were expected and the festival was ongoing, the office Recovery Girl had been stationed wasn't far. By the time Izuku stumbled his way into her office most of his adrenaline had faded and he was sweating profusely in exertion. He somewhat roughly tossed Shoto on one bed while he fell into the other as Recovery Girl came over to him. I would say you were being completely reckless again, but something clearly changed. Do you want to talk about it little Midori a recovery girl asked softly. Izuku panted heavily from his bed as she examined him and he observed his right hand, the same one he'd reached out to the shadow with. Another vision from one for all, I don't want to worry all might, but it sounds like what's happening to me is completely different from his experience. They talked to me, I don't know what exactly the context was they were trying to tell me, but it was so clear. All they said was not yet but then one for all course through me like never before. Izuku broke off after that into mumbles about what had happened as recovery girl gave him some candies and moved over to Shoto. She gave him a quick with her quirk while she waited for Izuku to build up some more stamina and sugar for his coming treatment. As she pondered her thoughts on what Izuku had shared recovery girl saw Shoto recover his skin tone that had paled slightly and toss in the medical bed. With his treatment done recovery girl turned and gave Izuku a healing as well and watched his bones fix themselves and his skin returned to a normal peach cream color. You've clearly made progress whether you believe it or not, so take this as a warning, I won't heal injuries like this anymore. Nothing serious happened this time, but you were close to permanently damaging and scarring your hand. Improve and find that better way to use your quirk. Come in dearie. Recovery girl spoke to the air as a knock came from the door. All Might stepped in, currently in his deflated state. What was that young Midoriya? Something changed and quickly during your fight. You even made young Todoroki use his fire. Were you trying to save him? Izuku retold his encounter with one for all after making sure Shoto was still unconscious and relayed the vision. All Might agree with Izuku that something was different and promised he would investigate it when he could. Izuku stepped out of the temporary nurse's office once Recovery Girl gave the okay and stretched to feel out his body. He was sore and his body ached. She had only healed what was necessary for him to be in good condition to continue the tournament. She was against it at first, but he convinced her for both himself and the trust All Might had placed in him that he would go as far as he could. His fingers and arms were healed, and he no longer felt sunburnt, but his skin was itchy and his body still ached slightly. Deciding he needed to heed Recovery Girl's warning and develop his new ability as quick as possible Izuku mumbled to himself briefly before he shook his head and tried to recreate what he'd done before. Coursing one for all through his entire body Izuku took a step forward and found himself face first implanted into the opposite wall. Removing himself with a bit of strain he noticed that the second he lost focus the power dissipated. Knowing there was no answer but training and practice Izuku kept the power up again and again as he made his way towards his seat to watch the fights. I wonder what I should call it, full cowling yeah, that's kind of catchy. Izuku lost focus as he bounced off a wall and crashed into someone. The first thing he noticed was that while he was knocked onto the floor, the other person was completely unmoved. Next was the slightly past waist length white hair and deeply tan like weak colored skin. Finally, his green eyes locked onto the deep and staring red eyes of Maruko. Oh, there you are. I was looking for you, was worried for a moment you might be dead on your feet. Here you are hopping around though, that's some good vitality you got. Maruko laughed at his predicament, while Izuku turned red not unlike a tomato and apologized profusely though stutters. No worries didn't even feel it. You really are a weird one though, guess that's why you're so interesting. Maruko poked and prodded Izuku's chest and arm muscles over his newly acquired gym shirt just like before. A curious look came across her face as she observed his body. Breaking bones one moment, then not the next. After that lighting practically starts shooting out your ass. Aha you really are a weird one, your quirk is a good one though, I can tell. Izuku continued to flare his arms back and forth as he attempted to stutter his way through a sentence, only to blunder. He stopped when Maruko ended her poking and placed a hand on his shoulder. Izuku took a deep breath and did his best to calm down, but a dusting of pink remained on his cheeks. Why were you looking for me Miss Maruko? If you don't mind me asking Izuku released his breath without a stutter to his astonishment. She just raised a brow as if thinking on it herself, then she stood straight and flexed her strong and well-defined bicep muscles. Came to give you my approval and encouragement. I respect strength, and you showed that you've got it. Also, I wanted to tell you personally that I'll be watching and cheering for you. What you said about your power in the cafeteria resonated with me, so prove yourself strong to everyone and win. I'll be watching and waiting, that's all I wanted to tell you. Maruko released his shoulder and turned around headed back to her seat. As she did a wave was thrown over her shoulder to Izuku who had devolved back into a cherry stuttering mess. He couldn't believe that one of his favorite heroes, and one of Japan's best was watching and encouraging him. Not to mention she's a girl, and a really pretty one. I, uh, no, no, stop. Izuku screamed internally as the thought passed him. 
He couldn't believe the thoughts his mind conjured as he tried to regain his focus. After several deep breaths and a light smash against the wall via his forehead Izuku had calmed down. He powered up his full cowling again and made his way to his seat once more. Every few seconds he would lose focus and then go again as he gripped at his new power. Izuku turned off the power once he made it to his seat. He noticed that Tenya's fight versus Ibarra was already over and Mina versus Takoyami seemed to be wrapping up. That meant minus the small break before the semifinals all that was left would be Katsuki fighting Kirishima. It's still completely untested in combat, but I should have enough of a grip on full cowling to try something against Iida. If I win that, it means I'll be against either Kaken or Takoyami, both are really powerful. Izuku shook off his thoughts before he could descend to mumbles and watched Fumikage push Mina out of bounds with Dark Shadow. Kirishima lasted about as long and well as Mina and Ibarra did as Katsuki relentlessly attacked his hardening with explosions before breaking through. Achako greeted Izuku and questioned his injuries. Along that same line Tenya gave a smirk towards him in a show of personal challenge. Once Kirishima was defeated Izuku and Tenya both left for the prep rooms for their semifinal showdown. At a cross in the hallway the friends went separate ways as rivals. On his way to the room Izuku came across Katsuki. Not unlike their meeting after Achako's defeat Katsuki snarled with a glare at Izuku. Deku, you damn nerd. You finally getting a handle on that borrowed power of yours. Doesn't matter either way, you better win, that way I can crush you in the finals for the world to see you damn loser. Izuku flinched back not only from his words, but also having his own words of borrowed power thrown back at him. To Izuku if Katsuki was still thinking about those words, that meant he might take them seriously. At that thought he steeled his resolve and glared at Katsuki's turn back. Kaken, I take back everything I ever said about not challenging you. This is my power, and with it I'll defeat you. Once that happens we can finally be equals. Katsuki turned around with rage in his eyes. Before he could say anything present Mike called over the speakers for Tenya and Izuku. Katsuki turned his back again and scoffed at Izuku as he made his way back to the class 1A seats. What was I thinking? That was super scary, but I meant what I said. Kaken has always been my shining example of victory. I'll defeat him and take that back for myself. Izuku gave a pep talk to himself as he made his way to the repaired arena. He felt as though he had only just left it, but he stepped back onto the stage a changed person from who he was before. I can do this, I don't know how well I can hold it, but full cowling should allow me to keep up with Ida. I just need watch out for his recipro burst, fight fast and hard, but don't pass my limit. I'm done breaking things, I can do this. Izuku clenched his fist tight with determination as he stood across from Ida. I'm surprised you beat Todoroki, but now I can finally challenge you directly Midoriya. May the best of us win, I hope for a good fight. Tenya bowed in his over-eccentric manners as Izuku smiled. He then tossed a hand behind his head and rustled his hair. Your challenge was never directly returned, was it Ida I'm sorry about that, but you're right may the best one win. This is just the beginning for us. Izuku smiled earnestly as he shook Tenya's hand once he stood straight and both retreated to opposite sides of the stage. Midnight called a start to the match with her whip, and both powered up to their maximum right away. Izuku used his full cowling to jump straight up and avoid Tenya's recipro. Just like I thought recipro right from the start, it's just like my full cowling. He's fast, but he can't maintain it long. He mentioned something about 10 seconds, I just have to avoid him until it runs out. Izuku had a solid thought, but he had paid no mind to his defenses while in the air. Tenny used the laps to rocket towards him from the ground and drop a devastating axe kick to his back. Izuku coughed out his air as he plummeted to the ground. The kick hurt, but even if barley Izuku hadn't dropped full cowling until after it hit. Once he bounced on the ground Izuku charged full cowling again as quickly as he could and pushed off the ground. He was able to avoid Tenya's follow-up kick that cracked the ground. Only a few more seconds, I can do this, I will win. Izuku pushed his body to the limit of what he could do and landed a counter cross with his right fist to Tenya as he regained his footing. Ada powered through it and landed a side kick to Izuku that cancelled out his cowling. In that brief relapse Tenya grabbed him by his collar and charged towards the edge of the stage. Only a few feet from the edge however, Tenya's engine stalled and he nearly tripped. Speed practically negligent, Izuku used that moment to break free and once more activate his full cowling. He fell to the floor right in front of Ida and an idea came to him as he thought of Maruko. She said she was watching, I hope she's okay with this then. Sorry Miss Maruko, I'm going to copy you. Izuku tucked in his legs and pressed his hands against the ground. In a show of true flexibility and agility Izuku surged off the ground using his hands. Once he was within inches of Tenya, Izuku sprung his legs out on a practically flying kick that struck Ada straight in his chest. Not unlike a certain rabbit-themed hero with her strong legs, Izuku hit true and Tenya was sent flying out over the arena line resulting in his ring out. Tenya gave out a heavy cough as he gasped and inhaled deeply trying to get his breath back. Izuku rushed over as he was announced the winner and helped Tenya up as he gathered his breath. Once he could see straight he let out a deep chuckle and slung his arm over Izuku's shoulder. I'm sad I lost, but that was a great fight Midoriya. Whatever you did against Todoroki seems to have changed you, I could barely keep up. This defeat shall be a stepping stone for me, next time we fight I promise I'll win. Tenya declared with honest pride at his honorable defeat. Yeah, I'll take you on anytime Ada that was a really good fight. I can't wait to see how much you've improved the next time. 
Hezuku smiled deeply at the declaration. As the two walked back together though, he looked around the arena trying to find the hero he had emulated and who said she was watching. Once his gaze found Maruko, he glanced a grin across her face. That alone would have made him proud and smile. But when he saw her grin widen and she flexed her arm again in seeming approval of his moves, he blushed. Izuku couldn't help it, it was almost like when All Might told him he could be a hero again. Someone he deeply admired and looked up to was giving their approval of him. Damn kid grows fast, he didn't do anything during the race, then he went from breaking his bones to a usable power. I'm getting pumped up, normally only the third years show this kind of potential, guess they didn't survive villains for nothing. Maruko smirked as she talked to the air softly and watched Izuku walk out of the arena. That damn nerd, I don't care what new power he is I'll still crush him like a pebble. He thinks he can challenge me, he's dead. Katsuki grunted to himself as he watched the fight while prepping for his own. Once Izuku and Tenya were back to their seats, Izuku glanced Shoto standing in the corner. Neither one said anything to each other, but when their eyes met Shoto released the briefest of smiles. He then nodded his head and turned his gaze back to the arena, Izuku had a proud smile that stretched across his face. It wasn't much, but a clear distance between the two had been bridged that no one else could compare against. Katsuki's fight was brief once he caught on to Takoyami's weakness. He was quickly behind the shadow user and created an explosion targeted to make as much light as possible. With Dark Shadow eliminated Katsuki held down his opponent with continued mini-explosions. Announced as the winner he glared straight at Izuku as he drug a finger across his neck with a menacing glare. Izuku took that as his sign to go to the pep room and mentally prepare himself for the coming fight. He knew in his own way that this fight was one long in the making since their battle training. But even further back than that, this fight had been coming since Izuku had discovered he had no quirk and the world looked at him differently. Once in the room he took deep breaths as he used full cowl as much as he could to get a handle on it. All Might said the limit my body can handle is 5%. Instead of trying to increase that right now, I should focus as much as possible on how well I can use it. My new technique increases all my physical abilities while it's active, that's why I barely felt to eat his kicks. He was also caught off guard when I kicked him. Would something like that work on Kakin Izuku mumbled away and thought as he bounced around the room. His focus lost Izuku smacked into the ceiling and then dropped 5 feet back first onto the waiting room table. A soft groan escaped him before he rolled off the table and then began again using his new technique the best he could. By the time the break was over and Mike called for him Izuku had fire in his eyes. No more running, no more hiding, this isn't like the battle training. I can control my quirk now, it's mine and no one else's. All Might already told me didn't he, I earned this, now I must prove that to everyone else around me. Even someone like Miss Maruko said she was routing for me, I can't let them down. Izuku took his last step up the stairs and locked eyes with Katsuki Bakugo number one obstacle blocking him from his future potential. His instincts are nothing to laugh about, instead of acting first I'll let him make all the moves and act accordingly. Once he's angry and not thinking straight I need to counter with everything I have and win. No thinking or plans will work on Kakin, I have to fight just like him, react as quick as possible and then overwhelmingly win against all odds. His last thoughts done, and plan said Izuku only nodded his head when asked if he was ready. As though they could feel the tension between the two childhood friends turned enemies the entire audience was silent, apart from Mike's commentary. With a shake of her hand and crack of the whip the tension was snapped and the two charged each other. Izuku dashed forward with his cowling, and Katsuki shot forward with his explosions. Their exchange was brief and quick before the two parted ways, but Kugo sporting a small bleeding scratch on his cheek, and Izuku a smoking shirt from the burn hole near his shoulder. Izuku was able to gather from the collision that Katsuki had more experience with actual fighting, but he was faster. Although it was a slight difference, it meant the two were fighting on equal footing, each his strengths cancelled by the other's weaknesses. You damn nerd. Katsuki raged as he charged back in. Their fight was neither quick or quiet as the two boys fought and collided repeatedly. Despite doing his best to remain calm, Izuku was also slowly sucked into the rage he felt for everything Katsuki had done over the years. Everything he wanted to say but couldn't came bubbling back up and was released through his fists. Izuku landed a left cross to Katsuki as he returned the favor with a her punch to the gut. With the wind knocked out of Izuku, Katsuki capitalized and kicked the boy away increasing their distance from one another. Gritting his teeth through the pain Izuku kept his eyes open and forward as he refused to release his hold on full cowling. Doing the exact same thing as before, only this time using his right fist to punch Katsuki on his opposite check, Izuku avoided the follow-up counter by the twisting his torso. With the briefest of openings created Izuku surged his forehead and crashed it into Bakugo, the unorthodox move landed with a resounding crunch of Katsuki's nose being broken. I'll kill you, you damn Deku Katsuki's previous rage was nothing in comparison to what he released at that moment. Izuku retreated as quickly as he could, but still got singed from the heat of Bakugo's explosion. Enough distance safely between the two, and far enough away from the edge Katsuki threw both hands forward and grinned like a maniac. Daya's shout was drowned out by the massive explosions that ripped out of both his hands, the same explosion he'd used to break up Achako's meteor fall. Katsuki grunted in pain and collapsed to a knee as the tendons and muscles in both his wrists 
and forearms pulsed angrily. When he looked back up and saw Izuku in the air having avoided the blast his rage reached a peak. Stop running away from me you damn coward. Bakugo raged to the heavens as he raised his hands prepared to release another explosion. Midair Izuku would be completely unable to avoid him, but before he could release the explosion he grit his teeth. Overcome by the pain surging through him Katsuki couldn't release an explosion before Izuku touched back down. Almost, this next move should end everything. I'm done losing to him, I'm done getting beat up, I'm done being a useless Deku. Izuku raged internally as he watched Katsuki's every move. When he overcame the pain and pointed his hands forward again but wobbled for the briefest moment, Izuku took that chance and charged. Releasing his control, he'd been carefully holding entire fight. In one moment Izuku's body went from using 5% of one for all to 7%. The difference might have been small, but in that one moment it was all that mattered. Izuku was in front of Bakugo before he could react and landed a gruesome uppercut to his opponent's jaw. Rattled by the unseen attack, Katsuki's explosions petered out and released small smoke clouds to the side. Not one to waste the opportunity, Izuku's instincts took over, he knew that attack wouldn't be enough to put Bakugo down for good. As such he kicked off from his striking position and spun to build up momentum. In the next moment he released a spinning kick that landed true and crashed into Katsuki's temple. His neck was thrown to the side and his knees collapsed under him as the deep black of unconscious greeted him cold and cruelly. Midnight threw up a hand and walked over to the down boy. Katsuki Bakugo is unable to continue, Izuku Midoriya is the winner. With a final flourish and crack of her whip Midnight made her declaration. Despite the audience's utter deafening noise, Izuku was in a world of his own as he released a breath he didn't know he was holding. He collapsed to his knees and panted heavily as his entire body was covered in cold sweat and trembled. I did it, I won. Izuku could think of nothing else as he felt years of pain and anguish lifting from his shoulders. An invisible weight he didn't even know he was carrying was released. As Izuku gathered his breath and stood up, he is standing straight and tall. Though he knew nothing had physically changed from the beginning of the fight, he felt as though he was ten feet tall. That was a good showing of strength. You won, and now the entire world knows it. Maruko's smirk was small, unlike her previous ones. The smile she carried was one of genuine joy, it wasn't every day someone caught her eye and then showcased strength well beyond what others believed was possible. The entire arena around her was practically shaking with the excitement of the conclusion to the sports festival of UA. Maruko watched as everyone stood and stretched for the brief intermission before the award medals were presented. She looked around as the stage was cleared away and three podiums instead took its place. Her head titled at the sight that she was witnessing, on the third place podium stood only Takoyami. Midnight mentioned the place also belonged to Ida, but he had been called away on family matters. On the next podium was Bakugo, Maruko had honestly expected him to be raging and thrashing after his loss and declaration from the beginning, but instead he was deadly silent. Finally standing tall, and with a smile that could practically blind was Izuku in first place. The medals were handed out by All Might, Maruko was slightly surprised, but glad she had decided to come if only for the rare chance to see the number one in person. When he gave the first place medal to Izuku, All Might had the same nearly blinding smile on his face as the boy. Once the festivities were concluded, the event ended rather quickly and Maruko was back out on the streets ready for a daily patrol. Given that it was the same day as the UA sports festival, even as the evening bled to night Maruko experienced a very slow patrol. Those that had gotten used to her presence in the area near her agency gave a brief wave, but none approached her. Maruko knew she had a tough outward appearance and was known as a strong-willed hero, but she never felt as though she was scary. Anytime she went out to do her hero work however, that was always how she felt. She was never showed any outright fear from citizens, but they also seemed to avoid her like the plague. I wonder why he was different. Midoriya was the first person to approach me since I broke the top 50 heroes two years ago. Maruko huffed out a breath as she grabbed food from a local convenience store and then headed back to her office. Once inside she left a drink and wrapped sandwich on the desk of her secretarial assistant who passed her a friendly smile. This roomy, with the festival over, the normal UA. Workplace study paper has arrived. I placed it in your office. Once you have given your normal stamp of denial I will have it sent out. Maruko gave a grunted thank you as she entered and glanced the small stack of papers that had to be completed by her personally. She ignored them and rolled her chair to face out the window of her office room as she unwrapped her own sandwich. The veggie wrap was one of her favorite, but as she looked out from her window she almost couldn't taste it. Events from the sports festival played over in her mind and they all kept circling back to a boy with green hair and eyes. Her sandwich was quickly finished and the trash discarded. Once she was facing her desk the paper came into view, as mentioned by her secretary. The normal procedure she followed every year was to deny the request for workplace experiences and tell UA. Teams were for the week. As her mind circled back to Izuku however, her eyes widened, and she slammed her head onto the desk. Shit, Rumi Yuzujiyama, better known by her hero name Maruko, had been staring at the blank paper on her desk for nearly two days straight. 
Whenever she didn't pay it attention and worked on other papers or duties it was always in the back of her head. However, once it was in front of her and she went to stamp it denied as per her usual she froze. Work studies is like having a personal errand boy watching how you work. Is that still considered a team roomie tilted her head and her ears flattened as she had the same struggle from the moment the paper had landed on her desk. The thoughts of the paper haunted her in everything she did, her sleep was restless, and her appetite had waned. When it even stayed in affecting her hero work, her secretary had noticed and questioned if she was okay. That lead Rumi to where she was, the deadline to turn in the paper was fast approaching. She decided it couldn't be put off any longer, as such once she was in her seat she had a pen in one hand and a stamp in the other. She had been going over her thoughts for the past hour as she looked back and forth between the two instruments that would shape her future. Despite her decision to complete the form and then forget all about it, she couldn't move either hand. A huff of air was her sign of discontent as she lightly crashed her head to the desk for the fifth time that day. Himery flip a coin for me. Rumi called from her desk. It's tails Miss Rumi. Her secretary responded back. He won first place, probably has a bunch of offers already. Not like he will choose me anyways. Besides it's not really a team, that's right he would be just like a worker. Rumi must over other justifications as she followed the coin decision she had made and wrote Izuku's name down in clear bold scripture. This is fine, he won't even choose me, this is fine. Rumi thought as she submitted her paper via fax to UA. Nezu would never release the knowledge to the public, but amongst the staff of UA. It was common knowledge that all requests for first year's workplace experiences passed through him first. With his quirk and knowledge of the students under his care as the principal he got first and final say on whether the requests were approved or denied. As such when his fax went off and woke him from his nap he was unsurprised, after all the deadline wasn't over yet. My my, isn't this a surprise? Nezu cackled in mad delight as even something he couldn't predict had happened. When he first saw the number and recognized it as the number 7 hero Marukos, he almost hit cancel to ignore it before his thoughts caught up. Now held in his hand paws was a piece of paper with a name for the first time ever scribbled across its boxes. It seems there are still things that can shock me left in this world. This will be a fun one to watch, foo foo. Nezu took a stamp from the side of his desk and lightly opened one of his ink pads. A bright green accepted was stamped across the paper before he sent it off with the other remaining requests on his desk down to the teacher's lounge to be processed. For Izuku the two days off after the festival to rest and recover and been spent in a near catatonic state of disbelief. He had physically been fine after the festival was over and recovery girl gave a final treatment, but mentally he couldn't be further away. Disbelief over his victory occupied nearly every thought he had, working out seemed to come almost naturally as an afterthought. Once his mind had accepted it and could process again he found himself back at his origin, just as All Might had told him. Dagaba Municipal Beach Park, Izuku had been back a few times, after all it was rather close to his house. But it still amazed him just how much difference one person and effort could make. As he gazed out across the sand and water he saw a crystal clean ocean and beach occupied by nearly 100 people. A bright smile graced his face as he walked down to the shoreline and did some stretches. Once he was ready he activated full cow, but before he could dash forward a hand was on his shoulder. Hey you're Izuku Midori right here that kid that won the UA. Sports Festival. Izuku turned and full cow deactivated as he looked at the person addressing him. Once that revelation had been made Izuku suddenly found himself swarmed by the other people on the beach. He turned a deep scarlet and stuttered out as attention was on him and he suddenly had females touching his muscles and asking for an autograph. Close, they're so close. I never knew it would be like this. I don't know how to react, help me all might. Izuku's silent call to his mentor and idol was lost as no one was coming to his rescue. When a pinch came to his butt however, Izuku yelped and ran away with all his might. Full cowl activated and he was far away from the situation before he could even process what had happened. When the next day rolled around and he found himself in a crowded train and unable to run away on his way to school, a comparable situation occurred. Everyone in the train car seemed to recognize him and gave out praise for his performance while asking for signatures and pictures with him. Izuku was completely overwhelmed and out of his element, but he took a breath and remembered not only the beach, but the feeling he did after his victory. Izuku straightened his back and stood tall, he signed every book that was put in front of him and gave a wide smile with a raised peace sign for every photo that was asked. He even held in his scream and only smiled when girls started touching his muscles and he felt a hand once more on his backside. By the time his stop finally came Izuku was steaming from head to toe as he headed towards UA. He fanned his face and took a deep breath before seeing the school. He was early, but once he saw the media starting to set up outside the UA, gate he quickly ran inside the school and headed for his class. Everyone around him was energetic, but his gaze drifted towards three people. Ida, after he had heard the news of what happened to his brother Izuku had been watching him, but he didn't know what to say. Shoto, since his defeat at Midoriya's hand, he had been more open, even if only slightly, when Izuku had passed him in the hall he gave a brief smile and greeted him. Last Izuku looked over to Katsuki, they had said nothing to each other since the fight, but when their eyes crossed Izuku saw none of the normal anger and rage directed towards him. His eyes almost seemed empty in comparison to what Izuku was used to seeing from the normally loud and fiery frenemy. 
all that was pushed to the back of his mind as he approached Tenya and placed a hand on his shoulder. I heard about your brother, nothing I can say will make it better. Just know that I'm here for you as your friend. You can talk to me whenever you're ready. Izuku had no idea where the words or courage came from, but Tenya received them gratefully. Perhaps it was because they were friends and rivals, or even from the fact that Izuku was standing tall and proud, but Tenya felt his words. Thank you, Tenya said. It might have not been much, nor was it what he was hoping for. But the fact that Ida hadn't pretended nothing was wrong or given him a fake smile as Izuku expected, meant everything to him. When the bell rang announcing the class had begun and Aizawa walked through the door he returned to his seat. Today's a special hero informatics class. You'll all be coming up with code names, your hero aliases. Shota said. Yes finally it's time to shine I've been waiting for this the various students of 1A shouted out their joy for the coming subject. Aizawa flared his hair and activated his quirk for emphasis as the class got quiet again. Before that, I'll be showing you the results of the pro hero draft picks I mentioned last week regarding the work studies you will all be undertaking. Normally there is more of a spread, but this year two of you got most of the attention. Aizawa said as he released the results. Todoroki, 3,864. Bakugo, 3,501. Takoyami, 353. Iida, 301. Kaminari, 275. Yeyurazu, 100. Kirishima, 65. Yuraka, 20. Zero, 10. Midoriya, 1. Wow the results from the festival are totally reversed. Wonder why Midori didn't get many Mina questioned with her hyper energy. He probably scarred them all away with that bone-breaking hum Midoriya. Mina said from behind the boy in question. Izuku only nodded in agreement, but mostly was glad that someone wanted him regardless of that. He also thought on how it wouldn't matter in the future as he already had a new method, so he didn't break bones. For those of you that got picked I'll hand out your personalized lists later. First you'll pick your hero names, but I'm not any good with that. Aizawa mumbled as he crawled into his sleeping bag and faced a wall to sleep. That's why I'm here. You need to put real thought into these or there might be hell to pay. After all what you pick now could be what the world calls you. Midnight called from the door as she strode in with a sway of her hips. The class began without much fanfare, and Izuku listened to his classmates' different names, but as he looked down at his board he drew a blank. As a child he thought of plenty homage names like All Might's, but now that he had a power of his own he had no ideas. He respected All Might, but after his revelation at the sports festival he also knew he needed to do everything he could to stand out from All Might. Time came and went before a light bulb went off in his head. I'll take both parts of who I am now and who I want to be in the future. Izuku scribbled away at his board, and just in time. Midoriya, you're up. Midnight said from the front of the classroom. Izuku stood proud and walked to the front as he placed his board on the podium. The entire class tilted in curiosity at his name. You sure that's what you want Midoriya? Midnight Sensei said we might not be able to change these. Genki said, Izuku only nodded his head. The ninth hero, Dekaru, it represents the change I've gone through and where I want to be. It can't be anything else. Izuku smiled as your rocker rubbed the back of her head. Embarrassed that he chose a hero name based on the reference she had made to his nickname. The rest of class debated over the ninth part of his name, but agreed it was a good reference to the coup or nine of his first name. I didn't even think of that. Thanks for the save Kirishima. The reference was actually towards being the ninth holder of one for all. Izuku released a nervous breath he was holding. He then turned in interest as he watched Tenya stand up with slow steps towards the podium. His eyes widened at the name on his board as did the rest of the class. I'm not sure if I can live up to this name yet, but that's even more reason why I must wear it proudly. For my brother that can no longer work as a hero, I will be Turbo Hero, Ingenium. Tenya had steel in his eyes, but deep beneath the hurt Izuku could also see the pride and weight that came with the name. Izuku stared at Tenya and gave a deep nod of understanding and smile of friendship. The last two students were Bakugo, who had yet to achieve a presentable name, and Shoto who chose to use his name as a placeholder for the time being. Midnight gave a nod of joy at all the hero names and told Aizawa he could have his class back as she left headed to the teacher's lounge. Woken from his nap, the homeroom teacher got up and started passing out the papers for work-study recommendations. The students began looking through the choices they had while those who hadn't been chosen looked through the provided list of 40 agencies. Shoto replied to a question about the number of recommendations he received as he explained it away as his father's influence. Izuku received both papers, as he had only received one recommendation, Aizawa gave him the list of 40 agencies. But, he never even glanced at it however, the second his eyes locked onto the recommended paper and it showed the number 7 hero Maruko he knew no other choice would suffice. Deku, who do you get I'm thinking of going to Gunhead's agency myself. Izuku couldn't even respond to Achako as he raised his paper to her and showed his recommendation to her. Yuraka's eyes widened at the name listed as she accidentally shouted out. Whoa, Maruko the number 7 hero. I thought she didn't work in teams, wonder why she gave a request at her outburst the rest of the class turned to her and then Izuku, like Yuraka the class looked on in wonder, except Minda and Kaminari. Dude seriously, she's a total babe. What the hell did you do to get her attention Minda screamed out as Denki shook Izuku back and forth. 
Izuku went to reply that he didn't know either before a rushed and nervous All Might opened the class door. Midoriya, my boy, could I speak to you briefly, please? The visage All Might held at that moment was not one Izuku had ever seen before. The class was over, so he followed him over to a hallway. Along the way, however, Izuku watched as All Might was sweating heavily and his legs seemed to shake. He got a request young Midoriya, his name is Grant Torino. He used to be a teacher here at UA, but only for one year as my homeroom teacher. He knows about one for all as well, is that why he reached out did he not think my teaching was sufficient? Stop shaking damn it. All Might muttered away as his entire body shook and he smacked his legs. Anyways, here's the address he provided. The work studies don't happen for another week, so you should also have time to pick up your repaired costume. Once he turned around All Might went to hand Izuku the paper but stopped at the look in his eyes as he refused to take it. I'm glad someone like that reached out and has an interest in me All Might, but I've already made my decision. This Maruko already sent in a request for me and I've decided to take it. Not that I'm ungrateful your old teacher showed interest in me, but I've realized I can't keep emulating you. I need to become my own hero and make my own path, that's why thank you, but I can't take that. All Might said nothing and only watched as Izuku stood tall and had a deep resolve on his face. Seeing the look in his eyes, All Might stopped shaking and reached out a hand to place on Izuku's head. He ruffled his hair around and a wide smile graced his face. I'm proud of you young Mai. No, Izuku. Prouder than even when you showed the world in the sports festival I am here. Your decision is yours alone, I'll send a message to Gran Torino and let him know of your decision. A deep chuckle bellowed out from All Might as he released Izuku and sent him off. With a look down to his hand that had rubbed Izuku's hair All Might smiled. He really will be a hero even greater than me. Now, how do I tell Gran Torino he was refused? Haha, uh -huh, shit. All Might's proud smile for Izuku quickly changed back into full-bodied trembling. Maruko felt lighter after her request was sent off and set back out on her normal routine. She felt as though something had inherently changed within her. She took down petty criminals and helped citizens whenever she could. But, she felt as though something deep had changed in her just because she had decided to send off a request. It's not a team, it's fine. Would it be so wrong if it was a team though even since she had sent the paper off nearly a day ago, similar thoughts had plagued Maruko. It wasn't as though her entire view had shifted, she still resented the idea of teams, but her acceptance of Izuku as strong seemed to have skewed what it meant. She put the thought to the side as she decided on pasta for her dinner as she returned to the office. Miss Rumi, a message in response to your request has arrived from UA. I've placed it on your desk. Rumi halted in her steps at those words. After a brief pause she placed food and drink on Himari's desk before retreating to her office with a quickened pace. She paused as the clear white back of the paper greeted her. All she had to do was flip it over and she would have an answer, but all her doubts came back. Once more she questioned why she had sent the request, why she chose Izuku as her first, other people had interested her before. Above all other reasons though, she was scared, what would she do if he had rejected her offer? Come on Rumi, it's just a piece of paper. You can do this. Maruko gave herself a small pep talk before she grabbed the edge of the paper. Once it was flipped over she realized it was a small letter. She placed down her food and sat in her chair as she read it from the top. Dear Maruko, we at UA. Blah blah. We are pleased with your decision too. Izuku Midoriya will be in your care for a week following the workplace experience. Please make sure all liability end. Rumi held the paper with a slight tremble as she read the final bits of it. She then stood from her chair and let out a cheer of victory. All right, Himari, we need to clean up the office and get the gym and training room prepped. We're having a workplace study here. Maruko cheered out from her office. Himari startled from the outburst put a hand over her chest as she calmed her heart. Then a small smile came to her as she listened to Rumi ramble on about things they needed to do. I wonder what he's like, Izuku Midoriya. Something about him is different to change Miss Rumi so much, maybe he can also dot 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 and oh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Himari shook off her thought as she continued to smile. Not many people even knew Maruko the hero had an assistant, secretary, but that didn't bother her. Rumi and Himari had been childhood friends, but Himari didn't have the same drive and desire to be a hero as Rumi. Even so the friends had decided they would both always support one another as much as they could, in any way they could. Once the hero Maruko became a household name, Himari had never smiled as proud. She pushed aside her thoughts of the past and stood. Once she walked the short distance to Rumi's office she smiled wide and glad. Rumi was an excited bunny bouncing all around her office while spouting off different things they would want to have ready by the week's end to receive their temporary guest. Himari watched on before she stepped in with a delicate gait and knocked on the door. Rumi, I'm proud of you. It was said softly, but Maruko heard it all the same. When she turned and saw her longtime best friend with a wide and bright smile, she couldn't help but tilt her head. What's that supposed to mean Mary been a while since you dropped the miss too? I'm always telling you not to be so formal, we've known each other forever. Rumi questioned her friend who only let out a mirth-filled chuckle. It doesn't mean anything special, I just wanted to tell you that. Himari chuckled out before she returned to her desk with a smile rooted on her lips. Maruko let out a huff and mumbled under her breath before she turned back to the work she had set out to do. Izuku had a grueling and slow week of school as he waited anxiously for it to come to an end so he could begin his work study. 
He was excited to be able to watch and learn from a real pro hero up close. The only thing that had managed to calm his nerves was when he went to grab his repaired suit from the support course. The design stayed mostly the same, but its color scheme had changed a bit. He learned that most people in the support industry were like May he met during the festival. Either way he wanted to test fit the suit, and once he was happy with how everything fit and worked, he decided it would be designated as beta suit. His classes seemed to drag on and everything was a blur, it wasn't like he didn't pay attention or work hard, but it could be seen in every student. Tension was building as the week continued each day bringing more excitement and restlessness to everyone. Despite that however, Izuku was still able to tell, although Ida hid it well there was still a shadow of hatred in his eyes. Izuku was worried but said nothing when Tenya mentioned he would be working in Hasu City under the normal hero, Manual. He knew that no matter what he said Tenya wouldn't be swayed, instead he hoped nothing bad would happen and wished him well when they departed at the train station. When they had first arrived the energy levels were sky high, the day had finally arrived for their workplace studies. Costumes in hand and the crowd gathering around them as they were recognized from the sports festival, Aizawa gave them a parting lesson and lecture. Izuku had wished Ida well and focused on his train. I'm only an hour away from Hasu, everything should be fine, but it's good to know I'm close at least. Izuku trailed off his thoughts as he arrived at the location provided to him for Maruko's agency. When he first arrived, it was not at all what he had expected. The building was very humble and could be passed by without ever knowing it housed the number 7 hero. Hello, Miss Maruko, I'm here for the work study. Izuku knocked on the door of the building that was five stories tall and resembled an apartment building. When he received no answer, he gently pulled on the handle and found it unlocked. He stepped inside the building and was greeted with an empty and open entire first floor. Her entire week before the arrival of Izuku, Rumi couldn't keep a smile off her face. She hopped around and completed all her work with an excitably nervous energy as she awaited his arrival. More than her usual cases were resolved, and in minimal time as well. Maruko had never felt her work was easy, but as she waited for a week to pass it seemed as though everything was going her way. Requests for local hero help or cleanup came in frequently, and she wrapped up everything nice and neatly. The shop she frequented for meals had an attempted robbery, while she was in the store deciding what to eat. The criminal was apprehended and Maruko received the unending praise of the older couple that owned the establishment. They had tried to tell her she would never need to pay for anything there again, but she politely refused. She had, however, been unable to deny them when they refused to take her money when she bought her food after the incident. A compromise was reached that it would be a one-time deal if she continued to keep coming back. Rumi accepted that as the store held all her favorite foods and supplies. When she came back the next day and found a poster of her in the window and the couple with wide smiles, she was slightly embarrassed. It wasn't as though she was unfamiliar with grateful people and seeing merchandise of herself. After all, it was part of the modern hero job, but she was glad the couple hadn't changed after the incident. She was still just another customer. True, she was treated like an honored guest, but it felt nice. When she offered to sign the poster and sponsor their store if they wanted, the old couple released a joyous smile and brought her into a hug. Rumi at first locked up and was unable to move, but eventually leaned into the embrace. As she grew up an orphan and had few memories of her parents, she was mostly unfamiliar with such displays of affection and care. Deep in the back of her mind the thought processed that perhaps that was why she only relied on her own strength. Even still she couldn't help but smile softly as she melted into the hug. When the hug came to an end Rumi was reminded that she was a 26-year-old. But when she felt a pit in her stomach that longed for the hug to continue, she couldn't help but question if that was what having a parent was like. All her life she had strived for others' attention in her own way, in that moment it seemed clear to her though that she just wanted to be loved for herself. Even with the revelation, it brought joy to her in its own way. As such the smile she'd had the entire week leading up to her soon student's arrival remained ever-present. After what felt like an entirety however, the wait was over and the day had arrived. Rumi spent the entire morning waiting and making sure everything was ready, then when a chime rang at her desk signaling the doorbell was rung she pounced down from the top floor to open the office door. Finally, the smile from all week vanished and she looked down with a frown. Who the hell are you? Izuku didn't know what to make of the empty room as he stepped inside the building. His first thought was that he had the wrong location, but he had made sure to double and triple check the number outside before he came in. Briefcase with costume inside and hand Izuku saw the staircase at the opposite side of the room and headed towards it. The walk up the stairs led Izuku to a wooden door at the top. Once opened, he revealed another witty open room. However, the room was filled with exercise equipment of every kind and weights far heavier than anything he'd tried to lift before. The floor was again empty though, as he made his way across it and up the next flight of stairs he came upon a metal door. He turned the knob and was met with a surprising level of resistance. Izuku put some force behind his shoulder and pushed the thick door open. What greeted him was a room with no windows and was covered in what looked to be thick padding or insulation. From his quick look around the room and deductions based on where he was, Izuku believed it to be a training room, made to withstand most any punishment that could be delivered to it, a suitable place for practicing dangerous moves or new skills. His eyes continued to take in everything they could, and though he didn't know what to expect when accepting the work study under Maruko, he didn't think he would find an empty building. 
Further across the room was another large heavy door that he suspected would lead to another set of stairs. Izuku made his way over as he admired various ropes or other instruments that looked difficult to climb unstrung throughout the room. When he made it across the room and opened the door, he was greeted with stairs as he expected. He walked up the first set slowly, before he began to hear noise coming from above him. The sound of a door slamming and angry steps from the other bend of stairs around the corner greeted him before the voice did. Honestly, senile old man walks in and thinks he can have first call on my student. I chose him first, damn it. Izuku recognized the voice as Maruko and quickened his steps up the first set of stairs. Before he could step around the corner, however, Maruko was first and didn't see him. As such he closed his eyes expecting the coming collision. Eyes closed though, Izuku felt his face crash into what he believed to be the softest substance on earth. When he realized he wasn't in any pain Izuku felt a pressure on his biceps. His eyes opened, and he was greeted with Maruko's fierce red eyes. The first thing he noticed however, was that they were a lot more beautiful up close than what he'd seen in passing at the sports festival. Second, he noticed there was a pink dusting across her cheeks that he thought complemented her wheat-colored skin in its contrast. Third, he noticed that she was taller than him, by at least a head. That lead him to his fourth and final observation before his brain shattered. He looked down and realized the soft substance he had felt was Maruko's S. Izuku had crashed face first into the deep valley of her cleavage, which was only accentuated by the form-fitted but deep-cut workout shirt she was wearing. Before he could be greeted by unconsciousness from the overabundance of rushing to his face, Izuku felt the pressure on his arms increase. He realized the pressure was Maruko holding him up, almost in a half-hug so he didn't fall down the stairs. The current problem Izuku had was that he couldn't breathe to speak, but his legs had locked and turned to jelly refusing to move. Hello to you as well I suppose. He knew move if I let go Izuku didn't trust his words and nodded the best he could which only succeeded in him further rubbing his head against her ass, unknown to Izuku. But regardless of having lost her smile earlier in the day due to her uninvited guest, it was once more in place. Despite the situation she found herself in, Rumi felt a pang in her chest that she couldn't quite place, and the moment she had released what and who she had crashed into her smile returned twofold. When she released her hold on Izuku and he didn't fall, she gave a small sigh of relief, but the small pang from before had turned into a light ache. She paid it no mind and led the boy who was red from the tips of his hair to the of his feet up the stairs and further into the building. Once they reached the fourth floor and were on level ground, Rumi noticed that although Izuku was still taller than her, he had wrapped his hands around his face and shrunk into himself. I'm sure you already saw most of the facilities, seeing as you were on your way to the fourth floor, but I'll give the detailed explanation on everything once we start using them. The fifth floor is our office space, and above that is the roof. Here on the fourth floor is the main living area, the kitchen and dining room are off to the left and the rooms are to the right. Rumi gestured for Izuku to follow her. She led him over to the various rooms and opened the door to one for him. A quick explanation to Izuku that this would be his room during the stay had him placing his costume case on the bed. After that was done she watched him unsling the duffel bag hanging at his waist from around his shoulder and place it next to his costume. Satisfied that he was settled in for now Rumi turned around to leave. We will do a light patrol around the neighborhood in the evening. For now, put on clothes for exercise that you don't mind getting dirt or sweat on. I was on my way to work out some frustrations, but now that you're here we can change that up. Meet me in the kitchen once you're changed. Maruko turned from the room and closed the door behind her as she made her way to another one. Hey, you see now old man, my student's here. Say whatever you wanted to him in the kitchen, I'm making food. After that I'm claiming him for training so figure out what you're doing. She greeted her other guests less than kindly as she closed the door and made her way to the kitchen. A grumble had formed under her breath, but once she was cooking food and her thoughts shifted to Izuku again her smile returned along with the small ache in her chest. It was around lunchtime, and she didn't know what Izuku liked, as such she made a simple rice bowl and light miso soup. When she was finished and placed the meal on the table for both her guests, the first to arrive was her uninvited one. The shorter old man plopped down into a chair and began to eat his set-out portion. For not wanting me here, you sure are being amicable. The old man said. Maruko blew it off with a huff. I'm still a hero you old kook, just because I don't want you here, doesn't mean I won't be hospitable. Not to mention, I only don't like you since you are trying to poach my student. He chose me damn it. Rumi mumbled the last bit to herself as the ache in her chest increased slightly. It was quickly forgotten and left behind though when Izuku walked into the room. He was wearing the same red sneakers she recognized from the sports festival, but he was also dressed like her. Izuku had on loose black workout shorts and a white loose fitted plain t-shirt. She saw his eye catch her other guest and his head tilted slightly in curiosity. Miss Maruko who is your guest she smiled at his mannerisms before she gestured to the older man. This is Gran Torino, he said you would know him and that he wanted to talk to you. Maruko realized his blush had calmed significantly, and when she mentioned the old man's name his eyes were blank. Then suddenly a realization crossed his face. Gran Torino, All Might's teacher, oh nice to meet you I'm Izuku Midoriya. But I thought you were in another district, also I choose Miss Maruko as my workplace study. Are you here about one for all, is something wrong? She watched Izuku suddenly spout things off that made no sense to her, but the old man's eyes opened wide and he waved his hands back and forth. Maruko had an ear twitch though it's something that stuck out to her. 
one for all. What's that? Midori Aizuku turned to her with a wide smile before he stopped, and a look of abject terror stretched across his face. Before he could say anything, Gran Torino spoke from her side. Uriwa's face betrayed nothing but utter confusion as he addressed Izuku. That seemed to snap the boy out of his peril, but he was just as confused. I just told you, Mr. Torino, I'm Izuku Midoriya. She watched the two from the side. They had clearly never met in person, but they both seemed to know about one another on a deeper level of some kind. Who are you? Tashinori now she was as confused as Izuku, was the old man serious or still messing around? She honestly could not tell, but then suddenly, Gran Torino shot from the table in a speed that surprised even her and kicked Izuku in the back of his head. There was a fur of green lightning before it faded. Your reaction's a bit slow, but you've improved already a great deal since the festival. Eat up. The bunny said she has lots to teach you today. Maruko gave a low grunt at the term he had used for her. I'm a rabbit you codger. He is right though, there is a lot for you to learn while you're here. We can go over some of the stuff while you eat, mostly what it means to be a hero. Most people equate the job to a civil servant, and they're not far off. Aside from the higher ranked heroes like me it's mostly all commission and effort-based payment. Maruko went over the finer details of hero work as Izuku ate away at the food she had made. Finally, I hope you enjoyed the meal. It's the last one I'll be making you. From here on out you will be doing most of the grunt work. You will cook all the meals, buy the ingredients, and wash all clothes. Aside from learning to be a better hero from one of the best you are also my errand boy. She expected at least some small denial or exasperation, but Izuku agreed it was fair and took the dishes to the sink. I can't believe how close that was, I almost blew the secret of one for all. Gran Torino deflected for me with the sudden attack, I need to think more. Once I recognized his name I got excited and started blabbing everything without thought. Izuku scrubbed the dishes while his heart thumped away in his chest as he reflected. He cleaned the dishes with ease and placed them on a rack to dry. Once that was complete he turned to Maruko, ready for his next task. She motioned with a hand for him to follow, as he trailed behind her, he watched as Gran Torino followed them. In the stairwell, he started to do light stretches of his arms while preparing for whatever came next. Before anything else, we need to do a basic rundown of what you can and can't do. I need to know anything and everything about your strengths and weaknesses before we can do any sort of work or patrol together. I'll do a task, then you emulate it, we'll start with simple stretches and warm-ups. He did as she asked and followed every move she did. As he watched and followed her example, Izuku's eyes would subconsciously linger over various muscles as they stretched and tensed. Maruko told him she was pleased that he was keeping up, but she also questioned his normal diet and exercises that he followed. The more he told her, Maruko gained a silent and contemplative look on her face. When Maruko felt she had enough information she stopped her stretches. I have a basic idea now of your limits, we will test them later, with and without your quirk. The old man might have jumped it a bit earlier, but he had the right idea. Show me everything you got, attack me seriously. Maruko gave Izuku a commander gesture as he backed up a few steps. Izuku was covered in green lighting as he wreathed himself in full cowl. The 7% he had reached during the festival still strained him, as such Izuku stayed at 5% when he charged Maruko. His increased speed meant nothing as he was suddenly greeted with air, Maruko had disappeared from in front of him. He found her, once he felt a foot pushing down on his upper back that pinned him to the floor. Again, it wasn't said as a command, but Izuku knew he couldn't refuse. He went to activate full cowl again before a punch struck his jaw, and he was laid out flat on his back. Again, Izuku rolled backward as he activated full cowl, when he looked up he was again greeted with nothing. Jumping forward he barely rolled under the foot that had been aimed for his back again. Now that he could see her Izuku followed Maruko with his eyes, he saw her touch down and slow. He took the opportunity to dash forward and punch toward her, as he did though, she titled to the side and his hand has caught in a net behind her. She was gone from in front of Izuku, and as he attempted to follow his arm snagged. Before he could look back and release it he found it was free. The pain from his ribs, caused by Maruko's fist, distracted him from the fact his arm was free because she had his wrist gripped with her other hand. Again, for the next two hours, Izuku was hammered into the ground, repeatedly. He took solace in the fact that the floor was soft, more pain emanated from his injuries caused by Maruko than him crashing to the floor. An end was called as Izuku was staring at the ground with strain as he found himself bent at the waist over one of Maruko's knees. That should do it for now. What's so funny Maruko tilted her head to the side as Izuku started to chuckle. After he had recovered his breath, he realized he was looking at her bare feet before a laugh ripped through him. I might just be delirious from the pain, but I suddenly remembered a long gas question on your hero page. People have always debated over whether you had elongated feet or toes because of your quirk. Izuku continued to laugh as Maruko looked down, her bare feet greeted her as she titled her head. She laughed slightly as well. People seriously ask that, haha. You're a hero nerd huh, guess I kind of expected that. Not like I particularly care or anything, but now you have an answer, my feet are normal. Aside from my ears and tail, my quirk doesn't physically alter anything else on my body. Maruko did a few cool-down stretches and drank from a water bottle Gran Torino had brought. She offered one to Izuku once he was able to sit up. You seem to have a good base, but from what you've told me, you're very strength-focused. Considering your quirk, 
which you still haven't fully explained, that makes sense. However, you shouldn't only focus on strength, my legs might be my focal strength, but I put equal effort into my upper body. She gave a light flex to demonstrate, and Izuku found his eyes laser focused on the strong limbs. Not just that, but you have a very slender build naturally, that's not to say you can't bulk up your frame. I believe you should work with your strengths, you should focus on building up your speed. That seems to be the main area you are lacking right now, your technique, full cowl was it that certainly helps, but you should build up your base first. My final points are your flexibility, based on the moves you're trying to pull off you are way too rigid. You need to have a pliable body in mind, also I saw you use kicks before, but you didn't attempt any today why Izuku took in everything she said, but then paused when she mentioned punches and kicks. He had used some at the sports festival, but when in practice and he had time to think he had only thrown fists. Izuku thought back to the revelation he'd made at the festival, and then looked towards Gran Torino. All Might's teacher, once he did things started sing into place for him once more. I was thinking too rigid like you said, I've been trying to emulate someone else. I don't really have a style of my own, so far I've just by throwing around my punches with everything I had behind them. Izuku looked down in shame once he realized that and started to feel a pit in his stomach. A hand on his shoulder made him raise his gaze to Maruko, she was close, and he was reminded that her eyes were beautiful up close. There's nothing wrong with that, after all you will be mostly emulating my every move when training to use my moves. It's how you take the things you've learned and seen from others and then turn them into your own that matters. My own style was originally inspired from others, but I put my own twist on it and made it mine. Don't be discouraged, instead think of it as your first step to making your own you. Maruko graced him with a genuine smile. The way her lips were closed, but slightly upturned at one end, rather than her normal wide grin from TV struck him. Izuku tried to cool his heated face, the sight was forever burned into his memories as one of the cutest things he had ever seen. He shook his head and slapped his cheeks a few times before he chugged his water. What's next Miss Maruko? She smiled at the energy shown and broke into one of her typical wide smirks. Izuku decided he would call the memory burned into his brain her crooked smiled. He couldn't ponder long before Maruko had a finger pushed against the center of his chest. The first thing we address is my name. I'm used to dealing with boring stiff people all the time, drop the miss, makes me feel old. I'm still only 26, just call me Maruko, or whatever else I don't really care. Izuku turned scarlet but nodded his head. I do care, call me Rumi. Maruko ignored that thought and shook her head as she led Izuku down to the second floor with Gran Torino still following. From a closest within the gym he hadn't noticed before she grabbed two towels. After a quick pat down to clear the small sheen of sweat she had accumulated she directed Izuku over to a weight machine. She wanted to see what his limits were regarding pure dead weight. As such she had him use various machines, after a brief explanation on how they worked. They passed another hour as she tested Izuku on. Different machines. Once she was satisfied, Maruko told Izuku to speak with Gran Torino about what he wanted as she went to shower before their patrol. You should do the same. Once you're finished here clean up before patrol. From your room, it will be down the left hallway last door on the right. Izuku acknowledged her statement as she set off. Maruko opened the door and tossed her workout towel in a clothes hamper. Quick to follow that was her shorts and shirt, which left her in her sports bra and Spanx. Those were quick to follow as well, and she walked into the bath area. She let the warm water pour over her curvaceous figure, before she began washing. The water rinsed through her long snow-white hair, before trailing her bountiful ass, and finally dripping down her wide hips and powerful legs. I'm glad I chose him, it's only the first day, but it's fun having someone else around. He might just be a student, but with the way he listens to everything I say and seeks to improve himself, it almost makes him feel like a pupil of mine. Maruko smirked to herself as she toweled her hair. Once she was done, she then toweled off the rest of her body and fluffed her tail. Reaching into a spare cubby against the wall she pulled out and put on another set of Spanx and sports bra. Before she could reach for one of her spare costume leotards, she looked up and her ear twitched as she heard the door open. Izuku had been through and survived several trials in his admittedly short life. From the early age of four he had fought against the world and tried to prove everyone against him wrong after he had been deemed quirkless. Even after he had received his quirk, his trials and tribulations had only increased. Izuku had proved himself to his number one idol and in turn received his support and power. He had encountered and survived villains, but as he slid open the door to the washroom and his eyes landed on a nearly nude Maruko, he knew his life was over. Nothing could process as his brain shut down, even so, he couldn't control his eyes. They roamed over every inch of luscious wheat skin exposed in front of him. Normally he would never be able to look or think of a woman in such a way without utterly breaking down. In that moment however, his eyes and brain were not talking to one another. While his brain tried to reboot his vision soaked in everything. He noted that her legs were long and built, her waist was slim and looked like a suitable place for his hands to rest comfortably. His eyes trailed over her flat but sculpted abdominal core, he followed the curve of her bust and noted despite being compacted in her bra they were larger than he thought. Idly his brain supplied that they were probably soft yet firm, and large enough his hands couldn't fully grip them. 
Her arms were toned and rippled with her untold strength just beneath the surface. As she was turned slightly to the side, he noted her ears were long with a slight crook near the tips. The snowball-shaped fluff of her tail looked like it would be extremely soft to the touch. Finally, his eyes landed on hers. I might have a thing for muscles. Izuku idly noted as they locked gazes. He expected to see a fist coming his way, or some rage, something. Instead, all he saw was a blank gaze. Maruko acted as though he wasn't there and grabbed her leotard. She slid on and put in place her tight one-piece spandex outfit and strode past Izuku once she was done. We leave in thirty minutes, be finished and in your costume by then. I'll put a sign up saying the room is in use. Once she was out of the room and closed the door behind her Izuku's brain caught up. He resembled a bright red steamed lobster as he flopped face flat onto the ground. Even the cold floor couldn't help his overheated body. After a few moments to collect himself Izuku stood tall again. Just pretend it never happened, that's what she did. It never happened, you can do this. Definitely a cold shower though. Izuku looked down as the steam returned to his face once he realized he couldn't control his body. His clothes were quickly tossed into the dirty basket as he stepped into the washroom and dunked his body from head to toe in near freezing water. Naruko's walk was slow and deliberate. Once she had managed to walk away from the washroom and turn a corner her calm composure was lost. She released a huff of air as she placed a hand over her chest. Her heart was thumping hard under her touch as a scarlet hue greeted her checks. The ache she had felt before clenched hard in her chest as both of lightning felt like it was running up her back. True to her word she gathered herself and then placed a sign outside the door as a notice of occupation. She retreated to her office to grab the rest of her outfit, when she did Himari was there to greet her. Maruko barely answered back as she mindlessly put on her metal reinforced thigh-high boots made to resemble a rabbit's foot. Next was her midriff plating, followed by her gloves to finish off the outfit. With a quick tap to the sides of her plates, the devices popped open and swung on a small hinge. Inside was revealed to be an ultra-compressed storage unit. Rumi kept basic first aid needs and tools in them, along with emergency food and water rations for herself. Pleased that everything was stocked and fresh she closed the plates and locked them. She cleared all other thoughts from her mind but paused as a strange one for her passed through. He wasn't flustered like I've normally seen from him, I wonder if he found my body hard to look at. The thought passed Rumi as she anxiously felt her bicep and ran a hand over her ass. She had never thought of herself as womanly, but Rumi also didn't believe she was unattractive. Himari silently listened to Maruko's unknowingly whispered out words with a smile. Maruko left her office and returned to the main waiting area of the fourth floor until Izuku was ready. She had given him thirty minutes, that meant he still had five minutes before her deadline ended and she would leave without him. Rumi was adamant about always being on time and punctual when a time frame was given, after all heroes weren't late. At the sound of a door closing, she turned, and her head instantly tilted. Izuku in his hero costume was not what she had expected, Maruko was stuck between laughing and being bewildered. The color scheme, utility belt, and mask all made sense, but the pulled up hood that almost resembled her own ears was completely out of place. Unknown to her Izuku had pulled up the hood to feel as though he had a layer of cloth to hide his embarrassed face. Why the ears, trying to look like me already she had intended for it to be a slightly snaky remark, but it turned into a genuine question. Izuku chuckled as he rubbed a hand behind his head to tousle his hair the hood covered. They are actually a carryover from my first costume design. All Might really inspired me when I was a kid, they are actually meant to be a homage to his hair bangs. Maruko felt a sudden bubble of anger at that, it wasn't that she didn't respect All Might. But, the way Izuku spoke about him while she was right in front of him didn't sit well with her. She grabbed Izuku by his shoulders and turned him around, once his back was facing her, she grabbed the hair bangs of his costume. With her other hand she placed it at the base of his neck and ripped the costume hood off. Pleased with her work she tossed the hood into a trash can as Izuku looked at her in shock. Much better, now let's go we have a patrol to do. Maruko had no idea what impulse caused her to do that, but she wasn't sorry. She was glad to see Izuku's green curls free again along with his red dusted cheeks and freckled face. Deep in the back of her mind that she vehemently ignored, she heard it whisper to her that she was jealous in that moment. Izuku was surprised, but not disappointed with the work he completed alongside Maruko while on patrol. She took the lead and he followed behind throughout their various tasks. Anytime he asked a question she answered it efficiently and clarified anything he was confused on. Maruko gave him the rundown of being a hero's inner logistics as they completed various odd tasks. Most of the simpler ones such as cleaning up litter or helping older people carry groceries was designated to Izuku. Tasks he was unfamiliar with, Maruko explained to him and the procedures to follow with them. The day-to-day -day activities were normally quiet, but she also explained and then drilled him on other policies he would need to be aware of. In the case of a villain attack or major crime, your first goal is of course always the safety of those around you, but it is deeper than that as well. As heroes we don't have any power of law to arrest anyone, but you must also have the mindset that until the police arrive you act on their behalf. Heroes are in their own way the everything people, you must act in any and all capacities until others arrive. Izuku nodded and took mental notes as he trailed behind her. The incident from earlier had entirely left their minds. With the atmosphere now professional, Izuku couldn't help but view Maruko in a light like all might. 
True, he was the hero Izuku grew up admiring and was his goal, that would never change, but in her own ways Maruko even surpassed all might to Izuku. He already knew she was strong, but being knocked down so many times during the training really hammered that in. He knew she hadn't really been trying against him either, also the way they taught was completely different. From his perspective, All Might had trained him, but Maruko was truly teaching him. She broke down anything he asked into easy-to-chew answers and took time with anything he didn't get. From what he knew of her as a hero she was honest and tough, but as a person behind the figurative mask, he found her to be a very kind and caring individual. Miss, uh, I mean Maruko, what made you want to be a hero Izuku asked. Maruko paused in her walk and turned to address Izuku. She thought for a moment before a light shrug reached her shoulders. It wasn't for any grand reason if that's what you're thinking. I grew up admiring heroes like All Might too. We aren't that far apart in age, me and you that is. Growing up as the oldest orphan and sibling in my care home. I took on a lot of responsibility and care for my younger siblings. I found that I enjoyed the work and decided to turn it into my profession. But if you want a deeper reason I suppose I didn't want anyone else to grow up like me. I'm the oldest of seven siblings. The time before All Might was a vicious and why time to be alive. It ended roughly around the time I was born, but there was still a far larger amount of villains than current times. My parents were average folks just living their lives day to day, but when I was ten they died, and I was left alone with six younger siblings to care for. They weren't killed by villains or anything if that's what you're thinking. Just a freak accident, but their death was blamed on the changing times. My siblings didn't really remember our parents, but I had some vivid memories with them, so that made me want to never let another child grow up without parents. That combined with my willingness and joy of helping others turned into being a hero. Izuku looked at her with stars in his eyes as she let out an embarrassed chuckle. Sorry for splurging like that. It's nice being able to share stuff like this with other people. I don't really do interviews or advertisements like other heroes. Plus, people are normally afraid of me because of how rough around the edges I am. Maruka was slightly embarrassed by the amount she had shared. Izuku shook his head and gripped one of her hands in both of his. I think that is a fantastic reason. I've learned a lot about different people and views since enrolling in UA. I think you have an admirable reason. Not all goals have to necessarily be pure when aiming to be a hero, but I believe there is some inherent good intent behind anyone who wants to be a hero. Izuku had fire in his eyes as her assured Rumi of her reasons and his belief. Maruko had another true smile on her face with a small dust of pink on her cheeks. She coughed lightly to clear the dusting and then pulled her hand back. Izuku seemed to pay it no mind as they continued the patrol, his eyes were observing the area and trying to see anything out of the ordinary. Maruko had explained to him that the basics began with having a firm grip of anything and everything going on around a hero's general vicinity. He knew that it would take practice, but Izuku felt he was slowly getting the hang of it. As he searched around for anything that might be construed as out of the normal, Izuku glanced a younger woman bump against an older man. Izuku would have moved past it, but then from the corner of his eye he saw the young woman pick the old man's pocket as she apologized to him. He quickly turned to alert Maruko, when he did she was staring at him. Don't hesitate, trust your instincts. Go get her, before she ditches the wallet. Izuku arched with electricity and shot after the woman. He had no experience with what to do, but he burst forward and trusted his instincts. He caught up to her quickly and gently reached out with a hand he placed on her shoulder. Please return what you've taken. Izuku knew that didn't sound very convincing, but when the young woman turned to him she suddenly looked as though she had seen a ghost. Standing behind Izuku and to his side was Maruko. Within sight of the criminal, her arms were crossed, and a fierce glare was on her face. The young woman stuttered out apologies and quickly handed the wallet over. She then silently sat on the curb of the sidewalk with her head down under the gaze of Maruko. While she watched over the petty thief Izuku dashed off to the old man so he could return the stolen property. He returned after a few moments and glanced to Maruko. What do we do now miss? Maruko when he almost put the miss in front of her name again she glared at him. After he switched to her normal name she laughed and ruffled his hair. Izuku ducked his head down and hid a smile that spanned his whole face. I've already called and alerted the police, now we watch over and make sure the subject is detained. After that they will be arrested, and we will talk with the police briefly and fill out an incident report. A copy of the report will be given to us, which we can then use to submit along with other reports for investigation into the Hero Association. From there they will process and analyze our efforts or contribution to society in the submitted cases and pay us accordingly. Honestly it's only the first day, I didn't expect you to be getting into this kind of trouble. This is valuable experience for you though, good catch as well on seeing the theft. Not many other first years would have caught that, for being so new to this you're a natural at being a hero. Izuku rubbed at the back of his neck embarrassed but proud for the praise. The rest of their patrol passed with relative ease, Izuku asked any question that came to his mind, and the dark of night soon fell. Izuku had mostly been successful to forget the run-in from the afternoon, but every now and again the image of a near-nude Maruko would pop into his mind. When it did his eyes would inadvertently trail over her figure from behind. They would always linger slightly longer on her shapely rear and soft puffy tail. Maruko led Izuku to her favorite store and told him the story behind it once she called an end to their patrol. Izuku felt as though he had learned a lot and was excited for the six days he still had left. 
Once the store was in sight he released a small chuckle at the large rabbit ears on the roof of the building. She had already told him that she had decided to sponsor the store after the robbery, but it was still funny for him to see. He had managed to put together for himself that Maruko saw her fame and publicity as more of a necessity rather than a desire. The first fact was her completely unmarked agency building. As such, seeing a building with her ears planted on its roof with her poster in the window drew a chuckle from him. She turned at his laugh and let out a huff of air before she chuckled along with him. When they entered the store, he asked her if there was anything specific she wanted as he had been designated the cooker. Hizuku set off to gather ingredients once he knew how many he was cooking for. Different ideas for several meals passed his thoughts. As he gathered ingredients, he also grabbed some teyaki as Grand Torino had requested. From their brief talk earlier, Izuku had still yet to figure him out. He appeared at first glance an old man past his prime, but Izuku still remembered the pain his kick had caused. The older man had told him that his reason for being there was mostly to oversee since Izuku had decided to have his work study with Maruko. Briefly they talked about one for all, but Gran Torino had told Izuku he was making substantial progress from the sports festival and just had to keep it up. Maruko was saying she would teach me her moves, she mainly uses kicks, I wonder if I could mix that into a style my own like she said. As Izuku's mind drifted he suddenly found the world around him completely void of light. He looked around, but it felt as though his body was floating aimlessly in water. Around him various shadows began to form and take shape, most were extremely faded and vaguely there, but three were extremely clear. To Izuku it was almost as though they were standing next to him. Despite the situation he found himself in, he felt no fear. When he looked in their eyes it was the same fire and passion he had seen in All Might and even himself at times. He knew right away that this was one for all trying to speak with him again in its own way. All Might said it was a power unlike any other, but that it couldn't directly interact with him. What he had also told Izuku was that the vestiges were there as a symbol of him getting better acquainted with his power. Deep down though he knew that thinking to be incorrect, his gaze focused back on the three of eight shadows that were clear to him. One was a tough-looking beautiful woman with black hair and a well-muscled physique. The second was a bald and broad-shouldered man with a rough but kind smile. His gaze was mostly locked on the third and final figure, however. Izuku recognized it as the same one that had reached out to him at the sports festival. With a clear image now Izuku could see he was a young and thin man, but the fire in his eyes burned stronger than any other. A smile rose on his face as he stepped forward towards Izuku. He knew he should have felt fear or some trepidation, but Izuku knew deep down no harm would come to him. The younger man's smile was bright and cheerful as he once more reached out a hand towards Izuku. He in turn willed his body to move and felt his right arm moving as he wished it. He clasped hands with the man and every nerve in his body was awake. Soon, the words should have sounded ominous to Izuku, but instead they felt comforting. Unlike before as well, the voices weren't mixed and jumbled. He could clearly hear and tell it was one man's voice speaking. Izuku opened his mouth to speak, but suddenly the world around him vanished and he felt a pressure on his shoulder. Maruka was pleased with her decision so far, despite all the agony it had initially caused her she enjoyed Izuku's presence. They got along well, and she found herself telling him things far easier than anyone else previously. She couldn't tell if it was something about his cheerful and trusting demeanor or something else. All that mattered was he made her feel like herself, it was easy to be roomy, rather than Maruko around him. Both sides of her were true to herself, but Maruko always had to act in a certain way or say certain things for appearances. Part of being a hero also meant you had to be well-liked. She enjoyed her work, but pulling a lot of the publicity out of it would make her job easier. Her assistant Himari was the only person she still believed knew the truest version of her deep down. Rumi had risen to fame rather quickly and at an early age as well, perhaps not as quick or young as Hawks. Somewhere in that time Rumi had fell behind and she found herself as mostly Maruko. She shook her head and looked for Izuku. She found him with a basket in hand and what appeared to be everything he needed, but he was standing completely still. Her head tilted to the side and she observed his unmoving body. When he didn't move after she called out to him she grew worried. The green electric energy from his full cowl turned on and lightly traced his figure. Unable to tear her eyes away she watched as his arms began to get covered in a dark black almost ink-like substance. At first she thought he might have been trying an idea and she would have reprimanded him for doing that in public. When he began to slowly lift off the floor by a few inches and she saw his white unseeing eyes she surged forward and gripped his shoulder bringing him down. Midoriya, you okay did a villain attack you answer me. She shook him roughly by his shoulders once his body stopped shooting off energy. His eyes gained their color back and he collapsed into her arms while still holding the grocery basket. Izuku was able to gather his energy back and stand relativity quick, but the concern didn't leave her eyes. What happened? Do I need to take you to a doctor? Rumi held onto his shoulder as she gave him a soft look of concern. Izuku didn't try and tell her he was fine, she could tell from his sweating brow and wide eyes. He did, however, say that there wasn't anything wrong with him. When she gave him a look that said she clearly didn't believe him he turned his head to the side. I briefly told you about my quirk during training and the sports festival right my control has been getting better recently, but I still occasionally lose control and my quirk takes over. When my mind drifts it sometimes just activates on its own, I'm not scarred of hurting myself with the power, but I am afraid of hurting those around me. Maruko could hear the anguish in his voice, she could also tell her wasn't lying but the truth was being skewed. 
believing it to not be her place to question, she instead put on a large grin and slung an arm over his neck. She brought his head down into a headlock, which also put his face against her, but she ignored that. When he shifted his newly turned red face to her she smirked and began to knuckle rub his head, just enough to not truly hurt him. That's why you're here right, from the whole speech in the form of a paper you a. Gave me once it was accepted you were coming here, the point of the hero work study is self-improvement. Your class already has a head start on the taste of what the real world's like, but you are still just high school students. Don't carry this burden yourself, share it with me and I will help you through it. She wasn't one for speeches but Maruko was particularly proud of that one. Izuku chuckled lightly and she released him from her hold, he promised to be more forthcoming, but she still saw a distant look in his eyes. For now, she decided to put the situation to the side as they headed to the checkout station together. He placed his basket of ingredients down, and she then followed it up with her basket of carrots. She only gave him a smirk when he looked at her basket, it was enough to make him chuckle and his usual energy to return to his eyes. Oh, Rumi dear who is this I thought you didn't like teaming up with other heroes. Maruko looked over to the older couple ringing up their food and smiled. She shot a thumb towards Izuku with a grin forming over her lips. This is no team, this is my new student worker. I decided to give workplace studies a try, this is a hero in training who decided to learn from me. You never did give your hero name though, what are you calling yourself? Maruko turned her head to Izuku, she watched as he smiled wide and proud with a gleam in his eyes washing away the earlier clouding. I'm Izuku Midoriya, the ninth hero, Dekaru, it's a pleasure to meet you both, Maruko told me what happened the other day. You appear in good health, I'm glad nothing happened to your wonderful store. Izuku traded conversation with the older couple as she watched from the side with a soft smile on her face. Once everything was rung up and she paid the older woman placed a hand on her shoulder to slow her down, Maruko waved Izuku on as she turned to the couple. He's a cute one, very kind and courteous too, you should snatch him up and keep a good hold. The couple had wide smiles on their faces as Maruko titled her head before she smiled. She turned and gave a wave over her shoulder before she responded. I will, he'll be a great hero. Not only will I make sure of it, but I've got a good feeling about him. Maruko said as she walked away slowly, she almost stopped when her ears went rigid and twitched. Dear, I don't think she understood what you were trying to say. The older husband whispered to his wife. Maruko still heard him but her walk slowed greatly as a red hue overtook her and the words processed a new meaning. Oh, no worries honey, I'm sure she knew what I meant. If not she'll figure it out soon, you can't hide chemistry like that. I can't wait to see how they turn out. Maruko's tail hair puffed up as her ears laid flat and her face was a low scarlet color. She picked up her pace and exited the store with haste. After Maruko released a huff of air her skin cooled, and she turned to see Izuku waiting outside the store for her. Their walk back to the agency was filled with a calm quiet as they embraced the cool night air. Once they made it back she directed Izuku to change and clean himself for the day and she would put away the food. He nodded and handed her the groceries. When he turned the corner out of her sight, her ear twitched. Gran Torino, you didn't really say anything earlier, but why did you decide to come here despite me choosing Maruko? Her ears perked up at that and listened in. I wanted to see your progress, it's that simple. You clearly have a good head on your shoulders. The way you were using your powers at the festival worried me at first. From experience working with him I know All Might isn't a natural teacher, didn't know what crazy ideas he might have imparted on you. Maruko twitched lightly at that piece of information as she continued to place the food away. Can we speak later about one for all I didn't really get a chance to ask you earlier, but I thought you might know something All Might didn't about what's been happening to me. Before that though, I need to call All Might and ask him something as well. She lightly munched on a carrot as she listened on. It upset her that after what she had said earlier he wouldn't trust her with what was bothering him, but she ignored the ache it caused in her chest. Gran Torino gave a light grunt of acknowledgement and she finished putting away the rest of the food as she heard him turning the corner. She waved the tayaki at him and asked where he wanted them, initially she wanted to kick him out after he said his piece to Izuku. The more he stayed around though, it seemed the more she learned about Izuku, to her that was a fair trade-off. Izuku took off his equipment and placed his costume back inside its case as he thought over the day's events. Maruko had already taught him a great deal about things he couldn't even believe factored into being a hero. It was as though a whole new world was opened in front of him, but it had only strengthened his resolve. Once his costume was off and Izuku was left in an undershirt and his boxers he grabbed his clothes to change into and threw a towel over his shoulder. He stepped out of his room and nearly bumped into another woman. Izuku had yet to see her before, but Maruko had mentioned her secretary to him. An apology came out quick for him before he lightly greeted her and was once more on his way to the washroom. When he stepped into the room he checked the sign outside the door first and then quickly disrobed the rest of his dirty clothes. Briefly he thought on why he hadn't been flustered by Himri as he washed and scrubbed his body. The thought was put aside as he cleaned and redressed himself in boxers, shorts, and a white undershirt. He hadn't taken much time while in the bath. Before he headed to the kitchen he de-iced to grab his phone from his room. Before the third ring Izuku heard the line connect. How can I help you young Midoriya is your work study going okay? I was surprised when I learned that Maruko chose you. Izuku took a deep breath and released it slowly. Everything is fine with the study, I'm actually learning a lot from Maruko. I need to talk with you about one for all. 
Izuku heard All Might go quiet, but after a breath he asked him to continue. I wanted to know if you had learned anything new since the festival. There was another vision, only this time. It was clear that's all. I'm not worried about them, but it's happening at random times so I am a little nervous when they occur. Izuku hesitated to tell All Might the full depth of what had happened. Something told him it was something he had to figure out. All Might explained that he hadn't found anything on his end from his memories and trying to have something similar happen to him. My last idea was to call Gran Torino, but I'm still nervous about that after I told him you wouldn't be studying under him. Izuku chuckled slightly at the fear in All Might's voice, but he could understand it now. Gran Torino had told him that he had trained All Might by practice fighting until All Might blew chunks. No worries, I get it, he's actually here at my work study with Maruko though. I'll ask him later, but there was something else I wanted to talk to you about. This is our secret now, but I've had a few doubts about something I really need help with. Izuku took a nervous breath as he quickly spilled his guts to All Might. He felt much lighter after his phone call and headed to the kitchen with haste. The call took a bit longer than he expected and he was running behind on making dinner. When he entered the kitchen, he was greeted by the three other occupants of the building sitting at the table and conversing amicably. Izuku greeted each of them quickly before he brought out various pans and utensils to cook with. He chopped and prepared everything he needed as the ingredients were ready to be cooked. There were not many things he knew how to cook, his mother had mostly done that, but Izuku was confident in his stir-fry. In the store he made sure Maruko wasn't opposed to meat and added the chicken into his veggie stir. Once everything was finished and the dishes set aside to cool Izuku served the bowls with a side of rice. He joined them at the table and with a quick thanks they ate dinner together. After the meal was finished he took all the dishes used and set out washing them. Himari was the first to leave and said she would do some more paperwork before she would retire for the night. After she left Izuku watched Maruko and Gran Torino lightly bicker over him as they debated the best way to train him. He coughed and drew their attention to him. With the dishes finished and drying he asked Maruko if there was anything else she needed from him that night. She replied that she didn't and that he was free until tomorrow. He saw her look from him to Gran Torino briefly before a huff of air escaped her and she turned to leave. Maruko can you please stay? I have something I wanted to ask and talk about with you both. Izuku watched her turn around and tilt her head before she nodded and sat back down at the table. He took a deep breath as what All Might had said to them earlier passed through his mind. What you said is right young Midoriya, this is our secret. I chose you because I trust your judgment and abilities. Do what you believe is the right thing. Gran Torino about the reason why you're really here, and Maruko about what you heard from when I first arrived. I want to tell you about the truth I learned about the world when I was four, how not all men are created equal. Deeper than that though I want to tell you about how I came to have my power one for all. Rumi had seen and heard a lot in her admittedly short career, but the story laid out before her was something entirely different. She had heard of all kinds of origin stories and quirks from other heroes and villains, but none were comparable. A quirkless boy who from the age of four was ridiculed and shunned by the world around him, with no one that believed in him. That alone shone an entirely new light onto Izuku for her, she had far more respect for his courage and drive. It was a story so absurd you wouldn't believe it if someone told you, but two things halted that thought. Their time had been short so far, but Rumi could tell Izuku wasn't a liar. Second was although he had been against it at first Gran Torino said nothing against Izuku's decision to tell her. Throughout the entire story he wasn't surprised or denied anything Izuku said. She rubbed a hand across her face gently to gather her thoughts and process everything she had just learned. Surprise couldn't even begin to describe how she felt but several things stuck out to her like chinks in armor. Why tell me why aren't you surprised why the need to pass on this power I'm so confused. She was doing far better than could be expected, but there was so much unanswered. Her first glance led her to Izuku, but she turned when Gran Torino coughed. I can take the last two, but he'll have to explain why he told you as well. I'm still against this, but it's not my decision. Maruko watched the older man grumble to himself about the situation before she turned to Izuku. Normally she would have expected a stutter, blush, or some reaction with her full attention on him, but Izuku had a cold and clear fire in his eyes. Reading people has always been something I was really good at, that's part of the reason I started my hero analysis books. Truthfully I've been feeling a deep need for a while to tell someone, this isn't something you can shoulder alone. I've had All Might and his friends that knew to share the burden, but no one I could claim as my own. Honestly, I knew deep down that I could trust you Maruko, I don't know why but I knew. Izuku passed her a small smile, but the weight of everything behind it made her clench tightly. It ebbed slightly when she clenched a hand in front of her and then turned to Gran Torino. I'm not surprised with how little Tashinori's told you. He probably thinks he's protecting you, but the less you know the more danger you're actually in. All Might is the eighth holder of one for all, his mentor and my sworn friend Nana Shimura was the seventh. My promise to her to watch over Tashinori is why I trained All Might. You might want to sit down for this one boy. The reason one for all has been passed down and continues to is directly tied to its origin. It's a story of two brothers who both hated and loved one another. If you think of All Might as the shining light and pillar of heroes, then there is also a darkness that lingers. The beginning of one for all begins with your greatest enemy and counterpart all for one. Gran Torino practically crushed his hands together, and Maruko watched Izuku stand completely straight. It looked as though from the depths of his soul those words struck him like lightning. 
Izuku felt as was right to share his secret with Maruko. All Might had said it was up to him and Gran Torino had been against it. He knew deep down though that it was what he wanted and it was the right thing. What he had not been expecting, however, was the terrible origin of his quirk. After the late meeting, Maruko had retreated to her room saying she needed sleep before tomorrow's training. Izuku was inclined to agree, but he briefly asked Gran Torino if he knew anything about the visions he had. He told Izuku that Nana had once mentioned something similar, but only that it was brief. The thing most circling through his mind though was all for one, Izuku had no idea there was such a being out there. When Gran Torino told him that was the villain that had punched a hole in All Might's guts he had turned as pale as a ghost. It was as though the name itself held power, once his head hit his pillow though, the world turned black. Izuku found himself standing beside seven people as his body was covered in a black smoke and rooted to the spot. The figures were all clear except the three at the very end, he recognized one as a vague image of All Might, as though it was still developing. As for the two at the end they were deeply outlined in black shadow and he couldn't see anything but an outline. He recognized two of the previous users as the ones from the incident he had in the store, the rough but beautiful woman, and the bald and broad-shouldered man. Izuku could also clearly see two other figures, one had two markings or scars that ran down his face, and the other was a dark-haired man that wore a high-collared coat. When he did a quick count, he realized there was only eight counting himself. One day, the norm of humanity suddenly crumbled away. In that chaotic age, there was one figure who united people faster than anyone else. Izuku looked forward and he saw the missing figure. Standing before him as though playing out a movie was the young and frail-looking man that kept reaching out for him. He must be the first. Izuku tried to speak, but his mouth was wreathed in shadow. Then his eyes looked forward, and his back stood rigid, across from the first was a man claiming to be his brother. His voice alone nearly made Izuku puke, but he had no mouth or body, he knew deep down that was the ultimate evil he was expected to face. Like a horrible nightmare scene after scene played out before him as he watched the brothers opposing ideals. One was twisted and believed the world should be tamed with fear and false loyalty. The other stood with a weak body but unflinching righteous spurt stronger than any other. He watched his predecessor be ridiculed and put down without any power or mercy, yet his beliefs never wavered, and his eyes shined bright. Time seemed meaningless as Izuku watched what he believed to be memories of the first play out. All Might had once mentioned that One for All was created by the unknown fusion of two quirks, and he had a sinking feeling that was where this was headed. Flash after flash, memory after memory came and went as he watched the first user suffer and agonize. He watched the siblings argue and fight over their convictions repeatedly, but then something changed. The memory itself seemed to play in a darker light. The brother Izuku now knew to be all for one spoke of a quirk the stockpiled power and even someone weak could use. Izuku then watched as he gripped his predecessor's head and he was powerless to do anything to stop it. Suddenly the world flashed bright and Izuku was forced to close his eyes. So, you are the ninth I've been waiting for you a long time, yet it also feels like I hardly had to wait at all. Standing before him and speaking directly at him was the younger brother, his origin, the first user of one for all. He couldn't speak back, but Izuku was completely calm as he watched on. I wanted to show you a bit more, but you can only handle so much right now. Your body grows and adjusts quick though, I have high hopes our battle can finally end. We've all long passed the point of singularity, you don't need to worry though, you are not alone. Suddenly reaching out to him with all their hands raised forward was the previous eight users of One for All. Izuku raised his hand with full trust and gripped the first hand. It's time for us to finally unite as one. I can't wait to meet you again, but it's not time for me yet. Just remember we are always with you. Another bright flash and Izuku found the others gone, and he was left alone facing the broad-shouldered and bald man he had seen before. You are not alone. Indeed the time is ripe our power can't just be used with idle thought anymore, looks like I'm on a time limit for now. Listen up kid, our quirk factors merged with one for all, they have been growing and so is one for all. You're lucky I'm first, I've got a great quirk you know one for all has been passed through eight people now before finally landing on you, the ninth. Listen well, you are going to develop six different quirks, listen to your heart, if you're truly our successor that's all you need. Use us and master us, complete one for all and take down all for one. But you should already know the most important thing, we're with you. Izuku sat straight up in a cold sweat, his mind caught up with his body and cooled rapidly. What he had seen was far too real and clear to be a dream, on the other hand he almost couldn't believe what he'd heard. Six new quirks to learn and master, he had only just begun to grip at what he thought was one for all, it turns out his power was far more than even he gave it credit for. He went to reach for his phone and check the time, as he did a small black tendril shot out of his forearm and wrapped around the device. Startled by the sudden tendril and light pulsing pain he pulled his arm back. Unfortunately, along with the movement came the tendril and his phone, it smacked him in the face, and he fell back on his bed. Aha, that was pretty dang funny kid. That's my quirk black whip, use it well that's a top tier quirk you know. Izuku heard the voice resonate deep in his core before it left him like a passing breeze. He was terrified, but also extremely overjoyed. It was like he was a kid all over again and he'd been handed a new All Might themed poster or action figure. The time on his phone told him it was still before his time to make breakfast, as such Izuku sat up and threw off his shirt. With this new ability manifesting he wanted to try it out right away, that also meant he needed to see where it came from. 
After a bit of experimenting he could make the small tendrils manifest with only a small pang of pain, he could also make them appear from anywhere if it was on his arm. Izuku also learned they were mostly directed by his will or thoughts. He had five tendrils on his arm attached to different surfaces and directions when he heard a light knock on the door and Rumi walked in. Figured I would wake I'm not awake enough for this yet. They'll make breakfast and put on a shirt. A small blush came from Izuku as he turned his back and Maruko closed the door. He grabbed his discarded shirt and headed toward the kitchen. Once there he saw Himari wash her used dish before heading up to the offices. With a question on his face to Maruko she shrugged her shoulder covered in another sleeveless workout shirt that lightly pulled his eyes down. Himari has always been a really early riser, you're just making food for me, the old man, and yourself. Maruko had what Izuku could only describe as bed head, her hair was ruffled and sprawled out as she released a small yawn. It was yet another image he deemed cute and had burned into his memory. She raised her arms to stretch out her muscles, and he glanced a look at the wheat skin exposed around her waist before he turned to the kitchen. So, what was that? I'm still finding this whole quirk pass through the ages an ultimate evil thing hard to digest. Then again I have seen some weird quirks, so what were those black tendrils? Looked like what happened at the store. Didn't make sense at first, but now that I know you have some super quirk it makes sense why you were floating, and your arms glowed black. Maruko would have said more, but she suddenly heard a wooden clack and both her and Izuku turned to see Gran Torino had dropped his cane. Did you say he was floating? That sounds like Nana's quirk he turned to her before his eyes suddenly shot to Izuku when he rubbed the back of his head and let out a soft chuckle. Izuku had managed to piece together that the woman he had seen was All Might's teacher Nana Shimura from what Gran Torino had briefly said of her yesterday. That and from the shadows he could see, she was the only female user of One for All. I actually had something I wanted to ask you yesterday regarding One for All, but we got sidetracked when I wanted to tell Maruko about my quirk. Most of the answers I was looking for were resolved, but I'm not sure you would believe what I told you. It's best to just show you, in this case I think seeing is believing. Izuku then raised his arm and focused his desire, a black tendril shot out and gripped Gran Torino's cane. So, let me get this straight, on top of literal All Might level strength six additional quirks are developing inside you Rumi had slept lightly the night before, but she had accepted everything she had heard as truth. Deep down she was flattered by how much trust Izuku placed in her, she thought it was also reckless. As she questioned the boy in front of her she had to stop and think of the ramifications. Even after one day had passed she knew he worked hard and picked things up quickly, but she also knew he tended to hyper-focus on things and get sidetracked. Now that she knew about his relationship with All Might it made more sense, but he had been so focused on using All Might's power that he had hindered his own progress. She noticed he was doing better about that and calling it his power, but she didn't believe this was a distraction he could have right now. One week was all the time she had with him now for the work study, and in that time she was hell-bent on teaching him everything to the best she could. Her name was now attached to Izuku, if he returned to his class and was anything less than the best and compared to the rest of his classmates that would be a blemish to her. She had seen his strength and resolve, but she had to draw a line on what she could and would teach him while he was at her agency. Don't take this the wrong way, but this is poor timing. I'm extremely honored that you trusted me with this secret, and I can far more easily direct your training now. However, anything aside from the original aspect of One for All should only be trained in your own time. You already said you had just recently got control over Full Cal. We will focus on raising your ability with that while strengthening your base. Anything else needs to be put off for the time being. I know from experience that if you try and do too many things at once you burn yourself out. She said her piece as she directed Izuku to finish their breakfast. From the corner of her eye she saw that Gran Torino agreed with her, but he was still mostly catatonic after learning Izuku would use his deceased friend's quirk. He ate the food placed in front of him slowly as he recovered his thoughts. Once he had eaten and left his bowl for Izuku to clean he stood. I'll contact All Might and update him on this sudden development. We should be able to compile together information on the previous users of One for All. Later before you both head out for patrol I'll have a spar with you. It's not good to fight only one person for too long you start to pick up their habits. Eventually you will need to learn to use the other quirks granted to you. From what you said it seems this black whip has already manifested. Also based on Maruko's mention of you at the store in your dream, Vicent thing and how it was described, it sounds like you are already developing Nana's quirk as well. I'll have All Might make a more detailed report later, but when we fight I should be able to give you the rundown of Float. Gran Torino walked off with his cane to grab a phone. Maruko left her dishes and told Izuku to meet her on the second floor when he was done. She left the table and quickly passed the third floor training room before she reached the second floor gym room. Most yesterday had been spent gauging where Izuku stood and what she wanted to improve on. Today she would focus on ironing out his weaknesses before improving his strengths. A section of floor was cleared away and she laid out mats for soft cushioning. Her style that she wanted to teach Izuku relied on speed, flexibility, and leg strength. He had one of those. Flexibility and his leg strength needed work. True his quirk could boost that with full cowl. But she believed you should be as strong as you could by yourself and then technique filled in the gap. Izuku was finished and standing before her just after she had everything she needed ready. She had him do basic stretches and follow her lead again. Once they were prepped she started him on harder exercises meant to increase his flexibility. 
When he struggled with reaching past his toes from a sitting position, she lightly pushed and helped him. The slight pressure that emanated from her was ignored, as was the slight reddening of Izuku's face. In the back of her mind she felt justified knowing she could cause a reaction, but she needed to focus on training. Her mind was locked down tight as she continued with each exercise. Time passed by quickly, she had Izuku do some cool-down stretches and she grabbed waters from a small fridge tucked away in the corner. Once she passed him a towel as well and the break was over she began the day's training in earnest. She had him stand to the side as she explained a kick step by step and then repeated it around ten times. Izuku was then tasked with replicating it the best he could. His first attempt laid him flat on his face and she had to stifle a chuckle. Maruko reached out a hand and helped him back up as Izuku reset to the base stance. She corrected and gave him pointers throughout the day as he practiced the same kick over and over. By the time she lost count after roughly 100 kicks and corrections she called a break for lunch. At the table after the food had been made Gran Torino gave them a breakdown of what he had told All Might in his response. He had been surprised as well but agreed with Gran Torino and Maruko. Until they had complied more information about the previous users it would be best to focus Izuku on one thing. When he went to wash the dishes however, Gran Torino asked to speak with her around the corner. I want to take a crack at him before you resume training and patrol, but there's something else. All Might clearly knows the kid better, but I still don't think it was wise to share the secret of one for all. Now that you know though there's nothing for it, regardless of how I feel I'll still make my thoughts know. My friend chose All Might and gave her life for him, he in turn chose Izuku, that boy trusts you far more than he should, you would be wise to not betray that trust. He then headed for the training room intent to have his spar with Izuku. Rumi was left without words, but she knew what he was trying to say. She hadn't chosen to have this secret shared with her, yet she was now a part of it. In the back of her mind to process everything she was treating the situation like a villain, observe, understand, adapt, and then crush. With this case crush was more along the lines of accept, since it was all tied together by Izuku though, he made it easy to give the trust placed in her back into him. From the side she watched the two trade blows as Gran Torino knocked off some of his rust and Izuku polished his activation speed of full cowl. Her feelings on the matter of having to share Izuku were still rather muddled. She understood why Gran Torino had been so insistent at first, but now that she knew about one for all it irked her that she wasn't Izuku's full focus. The thought was put aside as she dashed forward and aimed a kick at Izuku. She was pleased to see his awareness of the environment had improved. But the kick he used to counter her was still weak and off balance. She easily swept his legs and he slammed back first to the floor. She felt some of the anger leave her at that, but she also still wanted his training all to herself. That thought was what caused a pang in her heart that she couldn't and didn't want to understand. The training continued as she and Gran Torino traded off turns or working together to attack Izuku during the spar and improve his experience. For Rumi it left her conflicted, after everything she had learned, and everything he had gone through, Izuku still acted rather meek. All his accomplishments, and all his strengths, yet he lacked a real backbone. We are going to work on your confidence. Until I say otherwise all decisions or calls while we are on patrol will be yours. You need to have more self-assurance. If you want to be a great hero there will be times you must be a leader. I don't say this lightly, but you have the type of power that can inspire. If you don't have the will or voice to back it however, it means nothing. Maruko gave her decision as Izuku was laid out on his back, gathering air into his lungs. Something about seeing him be so docile really hit a nerve that didn't sit well with her. The training was called to an end so they could prepare for patrol. When she left Izuku laying on the floor she retreated to shower. She had been rather rude and quick with him, but she was upset for a reason she couldn't place. As the water cascaded down her body and washed away her anger and sweat, she knew there wasn't anything to excuse her behavior. Saying sorry would negate her words, but she still felt bad about how she'd phrased it. Izuku was a good person, and he had placed far more trust in her than she thought she deserved considering how little they knew each other. That spoke to her, he had looked at her, for herself and not the hero and deemed her trustworthy. A small heat pooled in the center of her, and she couldn't place it. She had dried her hair and placed on her leotard, but the heat wouldn't leave her. It wasn't unpleasant, but it also felt like a weight was pressed against her heart. The longer she was around Izuku the heavier the weight felt, yet it also made her feel physically lighter. Once she was fully dressed in costume she waited on the base floor and after 10 minutes had passed Izuku was ready to go. As she had told him, Izuku was placed in control and would make all decisions. She wanted this training to be two-part, the first and most important would be taking charge of situations as an independent hero. The second reason and larger problem Izuku was facing was he needed to be more confident. The patrol was slow, and he tripped a few times when deciding what to do. She observed from his back and came to one major realization. Izuku thought way too much and too hard, his actions themselves were almost flawless, but it was his inaction of decisions that slowed him. She saw it yesterday when he chased the wallet thief, his actions and judgment were swift and sharp, but he looked for confirmation of his choices. Perhaps a side effect of how he grew up being bullied and was a meek individual. It could have even stemmed from him believing himself to be useless when he was quirkless. Izuku always looked to others for confirmation before he acted, he had all the great qualities of a leader, but he held himself back. Rumi shook her head in disappointment but thought of ways to work on it with him. Confidence seems to truly be his greatest flaw. 
For someone who is great in everything else it's surprising how much he doubts himself. The things he's already done are far more courageous and braver than even some pro heroes. It's a shame too, he'd be a lot more handsome if he asserted himself. That thought stopped her movement and Maruko smacked her cheeks. Once the thought was put aside she watched Izuku laugh as he swung children around on his biceps. He was like a human carousel, that was the second thing she had noticed. Through and through Izuku had the heart of what she believed to be the best qualities of a hero. The moment he saw someone in need the indecisiveness seemed to vanish, hence how they found themselves now in a park. Izuku had watched one of the kids trip and scratch their knee, the child had started to cry. Before the parent could reach them Izuku had dashed off without a thought, he had a bright smile on his face and wiped the kid's tears. Once they noticed a hero was before them the child had a face of pure brightness and the mother watched from the side. From his utility belt Izuku pulled out some water in a spray bottle. He cleaned and disinfected the wound before he applied a small layer of gauze and tied it off. The child beamed at him and Izuku smiled back as the mother gave her thanks. At that point he had gathered a small crowd and became a human swing. She had granted permission when he asked to use his quirk and his new black whips were used to hold and swing the kids. The scene was almost picturesque to her. When she felt a small tug on her hand she looked down to see another small child. Rumi was never one to be easily approached, but that was what she loved about children, they didn't truly know fear. All they saw was a hero and twinkles were in their eyes, as such she found herself alongside Izuku as children hung from her. They both looked at one another and chuckles of mirth were shared as they spent the better part of an hour with the park children. When it came time for them all to go home the children waved tired and exhausted as the parents gave their thanks to the heroes. Maruko noticed a bright and wide smile on Izuku's face, it caused her a great deal of unknown anguish as her heart clenched. She had never had this happen to her before, the feeling was completely new to her, and she hated not knowing what it was. It didn't hurt, but rather ached like her body was telling her she was missing something. Izuku brought something out in her, she felt as though she was changing and improving as a hero with him around. As absurd as the thought was to her, she had never on one of her patrols been thanked so honestly or had as much fun. She had thought of what she did for so long as a job, that she had forgotten it wasn't about her. To prove her strength and ability to those around her she had risen as quickly as she could with little regard to how that painted her. If she were alone on patrol, those children would have never asked her to play along with them. But Izuku had flashed a wide smile and was the center of joy passed around. She didn't believe what she had done was wrong, but she did wonder if maybe others around her deserved a chance she hadn't presented them with. The chance she had given Izuku, even if unknowingly when she sent in her request. What she longed for most but closed off to those around her, a chance to know her Rumi Yuzujiyama, not Maruko the hero. I hope he wants to know more about me. For some reason I can't stop wanting to know more about him. Rumi watched as Izuku stood a little taller and acted swifter on his own judgment as the patrol went on. She looked at his broad shoulders and suddenly he felt so much taller to her than he was. A fist was clenched tight against her bosom and her heart ached painfully against her. After their patrol ended and Izuku had finished dinner and all his duties except for the laundry, Maruko had granted him an hour to train with his new power. By the time he was done, he had made little progress. Despite Gran Torino having told him about Nana's quirk and tips he thought helpful nothing happened. With Black Whip he was able to control it slightly better, but if he used it too long, too quickly, or tried to make one bigger than a small thread it caused him great pain. He cooled down with some water and then headed towards the room opposite the washroom. Maruko told him she had already placed all the dirty clothes in the bin and all he had to do was load and run the machine. Izuku opened the door and was quick to find the basket, he quickly began to load the clothes in but stopped suddenly. His hand had landed on something soft and rather round. This work study is going to kill me. A large blush was repressed as Izuku willed his eyes to not look at the size tag and load the bra into the machine. When his hand next came across a pair of panties he had to suppress an internal scream and quickly tossed everything in as he started the load. The time on her phone told Maruko it was only slightly before she normally woke up. She checked what the chime was about that had woken her when she did a large smirk spread wide. Action had finally come her way and she was ready to kick its ass, not to mention she might run into Endeavor. She always loved the chance to rub her presence in the prick's face, gave her a sense of satisfaction. Vernon was also easy for her to get along with, they both had a fiery and cheerful disposition about tough foes. Maruko stretched from her bed and lightly thumped the floor with her foot as her muscles all tensed and then released. Sleep had come to her rather peacefully, and with the news her phone had provided her, the day was shaping up to be even better. Her sleep clothes were tossed into a dirty basket, and she retrieved a new set before she went out to wake Izuku again. With the image of him shirtless still stuck in her mind a small dust of red rose on her cheeks. She would knock and ask for permission to enter this time, dressed and ready for the day she opened her door. Folded and set to the side neatly was her clothes from the wash, she tilted her head with wonder of how long they had been there. She picked them up and re-entered her room briefly to put them away. Before she could reach Izuku's room though the smell her nose caught led her to the kitchen. Izuku was already up and ready for the day, perhaps he didn't want a repeat of the previous day either. He greeted her politely before he returned to the food, her dish was served just as Gran Torino stepped out. She had been served a side plate of steamed carrots along with the main dish, a look to Gran Torino showed he had a side of teriyaki. 
Izuku said he wasn't very good, but each day he seemed to be improving his skill if the food was anything to go by. Maruko normally ate her carrots raw, so the steamed and lightly drizzled in honey carrots were a pleasant surprise. Tonight, we will chase after the hero killer in Hasu, as such training will be lighter today. Don't think I won't still put you through the ringer, tonight will be your next real test of a hero. Izuku looked at her in utter shock, but Gran Torino voiced his opinion on the matter. Do you think it's really wise to do something like that for a work study if he was your intern or sidekick it would be fine as he would be licensed to act as a hero? I don't think this is wise. Maruko understood his point, but she also shrugged it off. I read up on the laws and paid attention. As long as he has permission and the situation necessitates it he can use his quirk without issue. If any sort of problem were to arise I would fall to blame as the one officially watching over and responsible for his actions. That is something I'm prepared for, not to mention he's already encountered villains, he's more ready than you think. Most of the time I go after big names anyways. The day-to-day -day patrols are important to establishing a hero presence and trust in the community. If you don't go out and catch people hurting society however, I don't think you're a hero. That's my philosophy on the matter, you can be as strong as all might, but if villains don't fear your foot you aren't helping. Maruko refuted his claims and hard with her own views. She watched him back down as her gaze trailed to Izuku, he looked hesitant. After a moment though he gathered himself and nodded to her with resolve in his eyes. The food was finished, and dishes washed as Maruko found herself in the training room with Izuku. I said I wouldn't train you in your other abilities, but I do want to see your progress. Show me what you have managed and then we'll move on for today. Izuku quickly nodded at her suggested command. His progress was slow but seeing as he had just received the ability she was genuinely surprised. Show me your full cow, give me the best you can right now. Maruko watched intently as Izuku surged up with green electricity. It still wasn't instantaneous, but he was far faster activating it than when they started just two days prior. He told her he could also maintain 5% without any problems, and 7% didn't ache or cause him undue pain if he used it for a minute here and there. She nodded proud with his growth and gave him a gesture to attack. Maruko evaded easily but was surprised when a kick came for her chin. The foot was caught with ease and she tossed Izuku into a wall, but the kick had impressed her, and he hadn't dropped full cow. Her attention fully placed on Izuku they began to spar in earnest. Izuku had picked up her kick quickly and was already emulating other moves she had attacked with but not taught him. His execution and form needed work, but a bubbling of pride was in her stomach as Izuku attacked again. She wanted to teach him a lesson and vanished from his sight in a blink. Crouched low with her hands placed behind her she kicked forward and a burst of air blasted Izuku across his face. It might not be as strong as his, but did you think All Might was the only one that could generate wind pressure with his power? I'm still not giving it my all you know, if you don't start trying soon, I might just take a nap. Naruko smirked as Izuku lit up with fire in his eye as he surged forward. The speed impressed her, and with the improvement he'd mentioned, she believed he had boosted himself to his 7% limit of one for all. Enjoyment was clear across her face as Maruko traded blow after blow with Izuku. She ended the fight with a surprise or punch to his diaphragm. That was a teachable moment, like many opponents. He had been so focused on her kicks he ignored her punch that it easily knocked his air out. He gasped and choked for breath as Maruko called a break for the moment. Izuku improved at an almost frightful rate. She was once again glad she had requested him, and he had accepted. Within but a few short days she found she was fond of the young man and he had changed her for the better, even if only slightly. She had received fan mail before, but in the two days Izuku had patrolled with her the number had increased drastically. Most were normal fan mail she received as a popular hero that was also female. The most common ones asked for her three sizes, those were always quickly disposed. The remainder were of thanks for people she had saved or helped. That was what reminded her all the time what it meant to be a hero. She looked to her side and watched as Izuku rubbed his gut and had an air. A smile came easy to her before she stood. Just because she decided today would be lighter, that didn't mean Izuku wouldn't get her very best. Especially because Gran Torino said he would sit out today's training until it was time to go on their hero killer hunt. With Izuku's attention solely hers for training a smirk of joy came to her and her clenched along with her smile. She had yet to figure out the feeling, but she had decided it was a good feeling and put aside all other thoughts on it. Once Izuku had rehydrated and gathered his breath she was on him again without pause. He dodged and countered the best he could, but he still never got close to touching her. She enjoyed their bouts, despite knowing she was much stronger than him it felt good to mold and shape such a malleable student. It brought her joy that Izuku looked at her with such reverence and soaked up everything she taught him. A twirl of her body caused her waist-length hair to twirl around her, Izuku's eyes followed the motion. His distraction cost him, nearly in a full split Maruko surged from below Izuku and brought her foot straight up into his jaw. With his head thrown back and disorientated Izuku crashed back onto the ground and landed hard. She felt slightly bad about the level of punishment she was delivering, but nothing was better to learn from mistakes than broken bones and bruises. Maruko wanted to get a few bouts in before they broke for lunch, but she also knew rest was important. As such, she had Izuku drink some more water before they did some cool-down stretches together. She guided him on ways to improve his style and better his kicks. Once he had gotten the hang of a few stances she worked on his flexibility again. 
Have you thought of what you're going to call your new moves? An image in your mind of what you're aiming for typically helps. Maruko gave her advice while she asked what Izuku had thought on. I'm thinking of calling it shoot style, Izuku said. She tilted her head. Like a gun Maruko was genuinely confused. She didn't think that was the image he would have. No more like basketball. I was reading the news while thinking about it and came across an article written about the sport. It made mention that most people only paid attention to players' arms and the strength of their basket shots. The article went on to mention though that without agile legs and adept movement the players would be much less effective, the writer called it the hidden secret. When that was mentioned I thought of myself and how I'd only focused on my arms instead of my legs, it just inspired me. Izuku said with a small dose of embarrassment. Rumi chuckled good-naturedly as she tossed his hair. That's fine, inspiration can come from anywhere, do what works for you. As long as you have a clear image in mind it should be fine. She called an end to their break and bounced to her feet. Once Izuku was up and his attention on her she began their spar again. Izuku charged first with a fist for her shoulder, she dodged away and went to sweep his legs. He jumped over the move and aimed a side kick for her ribs. Maruko raised her guard and took the hit. The moment it connected she grabbed his leg and tossed him with great force. She watched him turn midair and hop off the ceiling right back at her. A smirk graced her face as she kicked him in his back and knocked him down. Something about their bouts energized her, she was overjoyed when he didn't drop his guard and rolled forward to await her next move. Maruko raised a hand and stopped him however, she believed he had improved enough with holding and activating his full cow for the time being. She told him that until stated otherwise, or it caused him pain to keep his limit raised to his maximum 7%. You need to get used to a little pain, before when you were breaking your bones, the pain was so sudden and extensive that you didn't really feel it. Heroes don't always get to choose how long or how much they must do something. A major disaster might hit, and you must fight or rescue people for two days straight with no food, water, or sleep. Even if it's not pretty you need to be as functional as possible for as long as you can. She explained that not only would it help him control the 7%, but it should also help raise his overall limit. His improvement in speed was impressive for such a minor increase. By the end of her work study, Rumi had decided she wanted to see Izuku reach 10%. Whether he could control it or not would be a different matter, but she wanted him to be able to handle that amount of power even if only briefly. The spar began in earnest again with the increased speed. She dodged and countered everything, but more effort was required. Izuku got closer with each attack, but nothing could land on her. Maruko smirked lightly and got in close to Izuku. When he punched out towards her she dodged around to his back. A leg wrapped around his legs and brought him down as another locked under his armpits and her hands locked his extended arm out behind his back. He tapped the ground rapidly and she let him go to rotate and relax his shoulder. She motioned him forward again, the next bout ended almost as quick. They exchanged a few blows before Izuku overextended and she capitalized. With a swift kick he was down to his knees and Maruko had him in a choke hold. He gripped at her arm but was unable to budge it an inch and quickly tapped out for air. Thar should be enough for now. Gather yourself and we will have lunch, after that another small session before we clean up and take the train. Maruko said what she needed and helped Izuku up. He sent her a small glare, but the mirth behind his eyes said it wasn't serious. You're ruthless, did you know that? My ribs still ache, and it felt like my knees might pop out. She only gave him a grin before his head was locked under her arm and his face squished against her. Maruko ignored the small shock of lightning it sent through her and dragged him up the stairs to the kitchen. Izuku was released once they entered the fourth floor, she turned her head to the quietly giggling form of Himari. What she asked with her head titled. Maruka watched a wide smile raise on her friend's face. Nothing Rumi, I'm just proud of you. The smile on her face was one Maruko had never seen before on her friend. I still don't know what that means Mary, you need to be more direct. You know I'm not as smart as you, that's why you do most of the paperwork for me and I kick things. Rumi could only observe as Himari continued to lightly giggle before she found herself pulled into a hug. It's nice to see you so happy. I'm just glad that's all. It's been a long time since I've seen you smile so honestly. Maruko was beyond confused as she tilted her head and looked down at her smiling friend. Izuku knew he was progressing. The very minor ache of his body despite a constant use of 7% told him as much. But every time Maruko defeated him he was reminded just how far her still had to go. In terms of strength alone she reminded him of all might. Her rank might have been only 7, but he wouldn't be surprised if she was on or above Endeavor's level. Lunch was concluded quickly and Izuku found himself on his back once more gasping for air. The pain was minimal, but he welcomed it. In its own way the pain was like his bone breaking. As soon as he got past it and learned from it, something better would be in its place. He had been tempted more than once to use Blackwick for a surprise attack, but she had said to only use one for all. His breath back he charged at Maruko before he stopped and pivoted backwards. He managed to guard the fist aimed for his face. The kick aimed for his lower leg, however, was missed and with a hook his knee buckled and his guard broke. With a swift uppercut his vision went slightly black and he crashed to the floor again. Her lessons were meant to improve him, but Izuku wondered more than once if she enjoyed knocking him down. What's funny she questioned Izuku's chuckle and he broke into full-on laughs. He was able to gasp in his breath before he pushed himself up. It was nothing, just a stray thought that passed through. 
he said. She shrugged her shoulders before a sweep kick was aimed for his ankles. Izuku jumped away. He'd learned that one too. If he got close for a counter, she would viciously counter into his. Stray thoughts could kill you in combat. Focus up front, on the moment in front of you. She may have said that, but the moment he did his eyes traced a light trail of sweat that dipped down into the valley of her exposed cleavage. The next moment he was greeted by the ceiling again as his jaw felt like it might crack. You're clearly distracted, drink some water and we'll take a five-minute break. Izuku agreed as he tried to keep his eyes off her. He had never experienced anything like it before, his brain told him it was wrong, but his eyes kept betraying him. He had always been aware of the women in his class and around him, but with Maruko he couldn't control the sudden thoughts he normally ignored. Knowing nothing could or would come of the stray thoughts he threw them away, but every time her body moved in a way that tensed her muscles he was drawn back in. He thought he was being discreet with his attempted non-looks, but he had no way of being sure. If Maruko noticed she hadn't said anything, and from their interactions she hadn't seemed any different. That thought lead him to one for all, he had trusted her with something that was about more than just him. All Might was told the truth when he said he couldn't keep it to himself anymore. After the sports festival and visions, the weight had suddenly become very real. There were people who knew, and he could talk with, but they all knew about one for all from All Might. They either couldn't or wouldn't in his mind be able to understand his side of it. Maruko had been an unbiased party to the situation, and from deep in his soul almost like one for all had been guiding him, he knew he could trust her. Because of that he had felt nearly as light as a feather even since he had shared the weight of his situation with another. Just knowing that someone he had shared his secret with was there and able to talk with released a lot of stress he hadn't known he was carrying. His thoughts ceased as a towel smacked his face. Maruko told him his break was over. He jumped to his feet and met her fist with one of his own. His hand blew back and pain shot up to his shoulder. It was ignored in favor of blocking the kick aimed for his temple, as in slow motion though he watched her kick change course and land straight into his unguarded ribs. Pain flared up and his air was expelled, but Izuku kept his eyes open and followed her next movement. He analyzed and predicted where she would attack next, with a twist of his body he dodged her kick. A punch surged forward, but she deflected it, and he found her other hand wrapped around his face. Once more the ceiling greeted him as Maruko was leaned over him. That will be all for today, clean up and then get ready. We will take a train to Hasu and then begin our search once there. Should put us there around nighttime, statistically that is when the most heinous crimes occur. A hero killer is also known for most attacking only at night. Izuku acknowledged her before he grunted and rolled over to push himself up. With the reminder of what their task for the day was he washed quickly, and his mind drifted to Ida. Izuku knew deep down the reason her had chosen his work-study location was because it was the last known location of the hero killer that had attacked his brother. The thought didn't sit well with him, but he hadn't heard anything through the class group chat that would suggest something was wrong. As he dried his hair, he reflected, from what he'd gathered his time with Maruko was much different than his classmates. True he was doing small menial tasks just like they were, but that seemed to be all his classmates did. He even heard Yayurazu complain about her time, she was set to be filmed in a TV commercial. Apparently she had only been chosen by Yuabami because she was a young and beautiful woman. A few others had gone out on patrol, but they had all been designated as complete observers. Hiroshima had collected litter, but none had been placed in charge or told to act like he was. Afraid it might upset them he had remained silent and said his experience was mostly the same, he knew he was different, especially since Gran Torino was there as well. The other thing he gathered was that the only one really receiving any kind of training like him was Yuraka from Gunhead. That was specifically why she had chosen his agency though, she felt she was lacking in martial arts combat skills and wanted a new perspective. He was flattered that Maruko was doing so much extra for him, but he also rationalized that she seemed to be the only one not treating him like a kid. He understood that they were first years and still young in comparison to some of the pros, but everyone else was being treated like a kid. Maruko, however, had told him that he'd already encountered villains and been toughened from it. She told him the only thing he had left to work on was his skill and self-confidence. Nothing would be immediate, but Izuku also felt like he was steadily improving in that area as well. With how she treated him as an equal and not lesser person, Izuku found he stuttered far less. He also spoke louder and more clearly, what also surprised him was how much taller he felt just by standing straight. Nothing had physically changed, but he felt like a new person. Maruko had told and reminded him several times that he was frighteningly strong for someone his age, and he was beginning to believe in her words. He was still uneasy about what they were about to set out for, but he changed quickly. Once he was in costume, he was also no longer Izuku, he was Dekaru and he had to live up to the name. A brush over the back of his neck reminded him of his torn and missing mask, in its own way it was already nostalgic to Izuku. It felt as though he had left another piece of his All Might reliance behind and was moving forward as his own person. Quickly he reached the first floor and was greeted by Maruko and Gran Torino fully in costume and ready to go. Izuku had yet to see Gran Torino in anything other than his costume though, he had an idle thought about how many he had or if he always wore the same one. Maruko addressed them both and he discarded the thought. The walk to the train station was accompanied by quite a few people pointing and whispering, but he paid it no mind. In the unlikely case they were separated all three had traded contact numbers and Izuku flared lightly red at that. 
He boarded the train with little issue and was quiet through most of the ride as he thought on their objective. When they had almost reached their destination, a screech was heard, and a beast suddenly crashed into the train. Maruko was the first to act at the sight of the creature before her and kicked it far harder than anything he'd seen. It went flying out of the train, the passenger car had stopped, and she quickly checked on the hero the beast had brought along. While she did Gran Torino chased after it, once the hero was checked her gaze met his. Let's go, whatever's going on will be valuable to you. Take everything, I've already taught you and use it now. Unless stated otherwise you are acting on behalf of me and have full authority to use your quirk as needed. She jumped out of the hole fast, and he chased after her at his max 7% without a hesitant thought. The sight before him was a burning city as he heard the screeches of multiple beasts. That thing is called a Namu, I don't know if it's a sibling of the one I encountered, or something else. The one from USJ was meant to take down All Might and had multiple quirks, just saying that with the knowledge I have makes me think of all for one. He might be the true leader behind the League of Villains. Izuku passed the information forward as best he could from behind Maruko. She acknowledged him as they chased after screeches. Gran Torino had disappeared to another location, and they were suddenly faced with two different Namus in front of them. Izuku took a slight step back before he stepped forward by Maruko's side. They each charged one, he used a method of hit and runs to get a feel for what quirks it might have. It seemed to use the same hyper-regeneration as the one he saw all might fight, but it also had some sort of muscle or power augmentation. The beast was rather slow, and he evaded it with ease as he thought about how to detain it. These things even human and a more decoru he wanted to say yes and believe there was a way to save them. The world around him wasn't always that clean or nice however, he knew that from experience. When it came down to life or death a hero couldn't always capture a villain. No, they're not, from what I remember they have lost all thought and must be given a command by someone else. The moment he said that Maruko sprung forward and both Namus had their skulls and brains crushed. Regeneration or not they stopped moving and didn't get back up. He watched Maruko lift her foot and give it a light sniff, she repressed a gag and her ears shot straight. Hug that stinks. We need to keep moving there might be more and other people will need our help. Izuku followed her without a word, he shot out a few tendrils of black whip within his limit and used it to remove rubble from areas and assist people that were trapped. They approached another group of Namu and Izuku overheard a hero calling out for Ida, he hyper-focused on that and suddenly dread hit him deep in his stomach. Maruko do you trust me? Izuku spoke far more clearly than he ever had previously. She turned to him with a tilt and paused for a moment. After everything you've trusted me with, you really shouldn't have to ask. She gave a non-verbal nod and Izuku shot off. I'll send you an address bring as many heroes as you can for backup once you've cleaned up the situation around here. Izuku didn't process the fact he had ordered Maruko before she was out of his sight. He wished he was wrong, but he followed her lessons and trusted his instincts. Izuku shot through alleyways and dark corner roads following everything he knew about the hero killer's attacks. I hope I'm wrong, but with a situation like this Iida wouldn't just leave for no reason. So many thoughts about the hero killer and League of Villains working together are coming to me, but that's not important. If he went off by himself Iida must have found the hero killer. He hoped he was wrong, but as Izuku bounced from alley to alley his eye caught something. With a surge to 7% Izuku shot off and landed a right cross to the hero killer's cheek. I'm here to save you Ida. His eyes never left his opponent as he scanned the area around them. Aside from just Tenya, there was another hero slouched against a wall bleeding from his shoulder. He took in his surroundings and analyzed his choices while deciding how to best fight. A pin of his location was sent to everyone in his contacts and he breathed out. The news has given several reports questioning what his quirk is, but I need to see for myself. He listened to Tenya raving to him about being left alone for his revenge and a small amount of anger bubbled up at that. If those are your words then heroes can't be heroes, the true spirit of a hero is to meddle even when they're not asked to. A true hero helps not because they are wanted but because they are needed, they help because it's the right thing to do. His words seemed to both impact Tenya and the hero killer. He seemed to have an almost manic gleam in his eyes at Izuku's words. The deeper Izuku looked though he almost stepped back. His eyes are different, it's like what All Might said. They have conviction in them, the eyes of a killer. Izuku surged forward the second he saw his opponent lift his foot up and close the distance between them. When a blade came from the side aimed to cleave him and two he ducked under it and went through his legs. He shot to the air quickly as Stain turned around to cut at his previous location. Free from his range and out of vis Izuku launched a kick for Stain's head. The blow connected and knocked him back, with enough distance made Izuku shot out Black Whip and grabbed the other hero. He tried to be gentle, but his control was still lacking under pressure, Native was placed down behind Izuku near Tenya. Stain locked gazes with him again before he had his blade and Izuku felt all control leave him. Did he get me? Where Izuku looked around and glanced a small nick that a drop of slipped from. Is that really enough? No way he made a point of ing his blade. It has to be can I do anything? Izuku felt a small tingle respond to his limbs, but he couldn't move them. When he tried to activate his quirk though it still worked. With no thought or hesitation, he shot out Black Whip. Stain stopped his charge towards Tenya and shot back. Ha, ah, finally, a worthy one I know you won't listen to me but that's what makes you worthy, even so I have nothing against you kid. A true hero like you might actually change the filth infested world we live in. Izuku ignored the gleam in Stain's eyes and focused all his will on Black Whip. 
He couldn't move, but that meant all his focus could be on the tendrils. Just like one for all, the absolute limit of what I can do right now without breaking myself. A small, almost thread-like whip slowly grew to the thickness of a rope. With his increased whips, Izuku shot them out to divert Stain's attention. He grabbed anything loose he could and hurled it at him. While he did that, Izuku also used one to pull himself towards Tenya and Native. As he did, a burst of fire suddenly shot down the alley towards Stain. Izuku looked up as a large smile graced his face. Standing before him protecting in front of the downed heroes was Shoto. The smile wouldn't leave his face as he felt a twitch in his leg. You're using your fire, Todoroki. What changed your mind? Despite the situation, he continued to smile. He glanced a small smile on Shoto's face. A very stubborn friend of mine beat it into me. I learned a very valuable lesson. Words can change someone as long as they are heartfelt. This is my power. Why wouldn't I use it? Izuku smirked as a grin came to Shoto. Stain suddenly shot forward a knife from his hand that grazed Shoto's cheek. At the same time, he ran forward. Izuku felt control return and blasted towards him with full cowl. He grabbed Stain by his scarf and dragged him away. When a blade came for him, he shot Black Whip to a wall and pulled himself away. Another observation was taken with the information he had been granted. Tenya had a slight twitch in his hand, but Native was still completely unresponsive. Izuku gathered the order they were incapacitated in and came up with a theory as he landed next to Shoto. I think I've figured out his quirk. I can narrow it down to three different possibilities. He needs to ingest for it to activate, but the effectiveness could vary based on number of people. Option two is the amount of consumed, and third is type. After a quick discussion about each person's type, Stain sent another bone-chilling smile at Izuku. Type, that's right. You are indeed worthy. Trash claiming to be heroes are a dime a dozen. Even the fire and ice one has promise. But you are different, aren't you? Yes, a true hero like you is needed. Society must but purged. You fakes aren't needed. Izuku felt fear down to every fiber of his being. But even still he stepped forward. Shoto support me. Something has changed. Ingenium, if you really want to carry that name, then be worthy of it. Get up and fight. Do your job as a hero. Izuku shot forward and dodged the blade aimed for his face. He saw the blade thrown into the air. Maruko had taught him about distractions. He refused to follow it. Instead, Black Whip shot out to grab the blade as he threw a punch into Stain's ribs. Once he gripped the sword, he flung it away and impaled it in a wall away from Stain. The battle was like a game of cat and mouse, and each side tried to whittle away at the time and land a decisive blow to the other side. Izuku watched Tenya zoom past his side and land a devastating kick to Stain's ribs. With him added to the mix, the match got even more desperate. Izuku charged forward before he faked and jumped straight into the air. Attention fully on him, his tendrils shot out and wrapped up Stain, as they did Tenya charge from below and Izuku from above. The devastating combo of kicks from the two heroes landed as Stain crashed to the ground. Izuku kept him tied up as he jumped back prepared for the next move. When none came, he gazed upon the unconscious form of the hero killer. He released a breath and tension left him. We need something to tie him up with. Do you have anything with you? Izuku turned and was met with the stares of Tenya and Shoto. He was as confused as they were until he looked down. From his arms and still connected to Stain was Black Whip. Oh, right. I was so used to Maruko knowing I didn't even think about using Black Whip. Got to think of something quick. Izuku had a nervous sweat as she started removing blades from Stain while Shoto looked for something to tie him with. Tenya apologized and thanked them, but Izuku paid it no mind. He knew there was a lot going through Tenya's mind. I had breakthrough with my quirk, turns out it's more than I initially thought. Since I'm such a late bloomer everything is still new to me. This black stuff is like an excess of energy my body shoots out when it can't contain any extra. His face was neutral as he tried to bluff his way out of the situation. Tenya was still just grateful to have been saved and his brother's foe defeated. Shoto held more doubt but also bought the lie as Izuku finished the blade removal and moved to pick up Native. He said feeling was beginning to come back to him, but Izuku was barely injured and he had a large bleeding gash from his shoulder. Once Stain was tied up, Shoto dragged him behind them as they headed out to see if they could help anyone else. They exited the alleyway and conversed amongst themselves as Izuku turned his head and suddenly several pro heroes approached them. Surprise was evident on their faces when they saw the hero killer. Izuku spotted Gran Torino, but he stayed in the background and said nothing. His best guess was that since he was officially having his work study under Maruko it wouldn't make sense to those around him if he suddenly approached Izuku. Have the Namu been defeated what's the situation like? Everything here has been handled. Is there more we can do? He was still shaken from his encounter with the hero killer but watching Maruko had taught him a lot. Everyone seemed to be scattered and they needed to be focused back onto one task. Despite the looks he was given information was quickly exchanged. The heroes had come from the center of Hasu. They had been sent by Endeavor and Maruko as they could provide little support against the Namu. Izuku placed Native down once he had full feeling and turned to the side when he heard a screech. Onamu came flying at the group. Izuku used Black Whip and pushed the others away as he was snagged by the beast. Izuku he saw Maruko round a corner as Endeavor trailed behind her. She was quick to charge straight after him as she bounced from wall to wall. Izuku wasn't one to go without a fight. He used his Black Whip to encompass the Namu's wings and slow its flight as Maruko gained height. She flipped and brought her heel down for a kick. Before it could connect the creature dropped rapidly as it lost all movement. 
Stain charged from the ground and caught Izuku before he stabbed a hidden blade into the Namu's brain. He stood and ripped the blade out killing the beast as he looked at Izuku. You are needed. Izuku felt a chill in his core at the eyes directed towards him. He grew fearful as they turned on Maruko, but he couldn't move. Maruko, you are worthy. A breath of relief left Izuku, but the situation wasn't over. Hero Killer Endeavor shouted as he charged up a blast of fire. Gran Torino got him to stop as Izuku was in the line of fire, but no one moved as Stain marched forward. Endeavor you fake society is overrun with fake heroes and villains who wave their power around idly, they should all be purged. A hero should need no fame or money as payments for their deeds, they are a hero because their actions are just. Come you fakes only one allowed to kill me is the true hero all might everyone was rooted to their spots and couldn't move, even Endeavor as the hero killer moved ever forward. Izuku turned as a blur of white shot passed, Maruko moved when no other could and landed a kick straight to Stain's ribs. He had clearly passed out from the kick, but even so he stood standing on his feet. The remainder of the night was a complete blur for Izuku as everything was wrapped up. He was still in fine shape physically, but mentally he was still completely shaken. Maruko came and placed a hand on his shoulder after the incident was concluded and led him to the hospital. Despite only having a minor scratch Izuku was checked in along with Shoto and Tenya to make sure nothing was infected or injured below the surface. He didn't argue and was quickly examined. Once they had run all the tests on him they wanted he was placed in a room with Tenya and Shoto. Along the way Maruko had disappeared and he was left questioning where they went from here. The remainder of the night he received little sleep as Tenya and Shoto talked about what they had experienced. Izuku listened and remained silent, but he was ultimately plagued by something much deeper. He had heard every word and ounce of conviction behind Stain's words. He obviously didn't agree with his extreme methods. There was, however, a part of him that he found agreed with what the hero killer defined as a true hero. His methods and ideas had been twisted to the extreme, but Izuku felt sickly connected to him. They both in their own ways idolized the ultimate hero, All Might, that was where Izuku found his dilemma. How could two people both believe so heavily in a person yet their views of how to be like him be so drastically different? Even the ideology was different between the two, Izuku believed it was fine to be a hero for money for fame. Yuraka had taught him that, he believed it wasn't the goal itself, but the purpose behind it that to find a person is just. She wanted to be a hero for money, but in the end it wasn't for her, it was the spurt of helping others that drove her to desire money. They were so different, yet they believed in similar things, Izuku felt sick yet conflicted. Stain had proclaimed both himself and Maruko as worthy but Endeavor a fake. What drove him to define and end people's lives so carelessly, had he let Tenya's brother live only to spread his name or because he saw him as someone with potential as well? He had question after question, but no answers. By the time morning rolled around his sleep had been entirely restless. Once they all woke up conversation was spread lightly before their doctor came in. Izuku had been cleared, as had Shoto after his wounds were wrapped and declared infection-free. When Tenya's turn came he was told the worst news amongst them, nothing had been permanently damaged, but he did serious harm to his arms and his fingers would experience stiffness. The news was met with relative understanding from Tenya, he stated the wound was a way to show his ignorant way of thinking. He declared that until he could become a true hero and live up to the name he'd inherited he would keep the injury. Before they could converse more the door was opened and Maruko walked in followed by Manuel and a large dog person. He wanted to greet Maruko and ask her how she was, but the dog man spoke first and introduced himself as the police chief. Izuku had a feeling of dread, but a look he could see from Maruko told him everything would be fine. Once they had heard out the chief, Izuku was slightly conflicted again. Under normal circumstances, if they were given credit, Tenya and Shoto would have been reprimanded along with Endeavor and Manuel. While not in her presence, Izuku had been given express permission to use his power by Maruko. He had also informed her of the situation and provided contact for support, as he had thought calmly under pressure, neither he nor Maruko would receive punishment. For the police to save face, while also allowing Tenya and Shoto's promising career as heroes to continue the situation would be swept under the rug and credit given to Maruko. Just because he understood didn't mean the situation sat well with him, but he did understand. Once they all gave their answer and the police chief bowed and gave his personal thanks Izuku felt the weight lift slightly. He had been cleared and Maruko wanted to use their remaining roughly four days to finish his work study. The two of them found themselves sitting beside one another as they silently rode the train back to Maruko's agency. She had informed him that after Gran Torino encountered and fought the Namu he had jumped to the same conclusion as Izuku. He believed All for One was back and secretly funding the League of Villains from the shadows. As such he was teaming up with the police to help an investigation that left the two of them alone. You haven't said much. Everything okay, I know you have encountered villains before, but even I was shaken slightly by that. Maruko lightly grabbed his head and brought it to her shoulder. Normally he would have been flustered, but truthfully he was glad for the human contact. After everything that happened he enjoyed the simple and kind warmth of another person. Unconflicted a bit, I don't think he was right, but I also can't help but think he wasn't wrong. Something about him was different, but I can't stop thoughts of what he said. This is something I believe I have to solve for myself, and the answer I get will shape the hero I'll become. He was afraid of what Maruko might think of his words, but she said nothing. 
A hand reached up and lightly ruffled his hair before she leaned her head on top of his. Izuku never would have believed she would do that, let alone in public, but when he looked up the train was empty aside from them. Most people were still reeling from the attack on Hasu and as such the train was void of passengers. He took the situation for what it was and leaned into the comforting moment. Before he could think more he suddenly sat straight up as lightning surged though him. Maruko's head slipped from on top of him and landed on his legs with a small thud. Izuku wanted to freak out, but when he noticed bags under her eyes and heard a small almost snore coming from her he calmed down. She must have gotten very little to no sleep because of yesterday's events. Izuku smiled lightly and was glad again that he had made the decision to study under such a great hero. He found his hand unconsciously petting her head as his fingers de her hair. Maruko sighed in her sleep and curled into his warmth as her face snuggled into his. Despite his efforts to remain calm Izuku was cherry red. Her hair was incredibly soft, and he felt his stress leaving him as he carted his hands though it. Time was eventually lost to him before the train called out that their stop had arrived. Lightly her shook her shoulder to try and wake her, but he was unsuccessful. Knowing they couldn't miss their stop he sat up without disturbing her rest. Please forgive me Maruko. He reached down and the hand was placed underneath her knees and another on her upper back. Izuku knew Maruko was 5'2 nearly 5'3. As such he estimated her weight with her muscle mass to be between 115 and 125 pounds. But she felt light as a feather as he lifted her. The walk to her agency was rather short and it was still early. He breathed a sigh of relief as no one had seen him carry Maruko to her office. He opened her door and noticed that Maruko's room was rather plain all things considered. Once he safely placed her down and tucked her into her bed Izuku retreated to his own room. His back turned to her Izuku couldn't see her now open eyes and rapidly reddening face. Aside from Himari it was now only him and Maruko in the building. Izuku was slightly saddened Gran Torino had left, but he also understood the need to investigate a possible all-for-one connection. His thoughts were rampant, but once his head hit the pillow of a bed he was familiar with he was out like a light. Maruko had seen a lot of things in her time as a hero, but when she woke up halfway to her agency in Izuku's arms she tried not to panic. Afraid of being dropped, but also embarrassed to have fallen asleep with no recollection of when, she tried not to move a muscle. Once she calmed and realized Izuku wasn't looking at her, but rather around them she took a minute to appreciate the situation. She didn't feel weak but being in his arms was a nice feeling. Maruko was so used to others relying on her strength when around her, it was a pleasant change for once to her. The feeling of his admittedly buff and defined arms wrapped around her was warm and comforting. Pretending as though she was asleep the entire time, Maruko enjoyed the feeling as they approached her agency. When he placed her down in her bed, a strange feeling overtook her. Izuku pulled up her covers and tucked her into the bed, but she was strangely driven to reach her call out to Izuku and see what he would do. By the time the thought had passed through Rumi, her face was a soft red as her eyes opened and she watched Izuku walk out. Left alone with her thoughts and embarrassment she buried her head into her pillow and sleep was quick to claim her. Once she woke Maruko noticed several hours had passed and it was nearing lunch. She got up and was quick to remove her sweat and dirt-covered costume, which left her in undergarments. Knowing she needed a bath to not only wake up but also clean all the grime off she headed to the bath area and noticed the sign was flipped. She went to knock on the door before it suddenly opened, and her hand post to knock landed on Izuku's. He was mostly dry, but rivulets of water fell from his hair and trailed his body. She had seen brief glimpses here and there but clad in only a towel wrapped around his waist Rumi was given a full up close view of how to find Izuku was. The view was incredibly well received as she felt the heat and muscles tensing beneath her hand on his. Before she could say anything or remove her hand she suddenly found it touch air as Izuku moved back and closed the door separating them. She held it back well, but her ached at the loose of heat beneath her hand, and a red hue rose to her cheeks. A look down reminded her she was clad in a bra and panties she was once more questioning her womanly charm as she had noticed no fluster to Izuku. Sorry about that, I flipped the sign but after the events of yesterday I forgot to bring in a change of clothes. I'm going to quickly pass by to my room and grab some clothes, then I'll make lunch for us. She noticed his tone was level and calm, which made her again question her charm and why it mattered to her. With a quick acknowledgement to him she stepped out of the way and watched him pass by to his room. His figure was appreciated again as she stepped into the bath area and saw small droplets of on the floor. She hadn't seen any injuries on Izuku and the hospital had cleared him, so she put her worry aside to bathe and clean herself. The in brains from her kicks had clung to her rabbit boots, she decided they would be burned as warm water soothed her skin. After the night's events and a well-earned rest, the water was a nice reprieve. Her thoughts drifted to the results of last night. Despite how worried she had been when a ping of his location came in from Izuku, she was also proud. True he hadn't done it all by himself, but he had managed to capture the hero killer, their original objective in going to Hasu. The credit had been given to her, but she also knew the truth and was incredibly proud. Normally she would never take credit for another's work, but she also understood the necessity of protecting Izuku's friends. As the police chief had said Izuku was protected because she had given him permission to fight, but his friends hadn't. She also knew Izuku wouldn't let his friends take the fall just so he could have glory. In the back of her mind soothed by the calming water however, there was a rouge thought. 
How far would she go to protect Izuku? The reluctant work-study application had turned into a person she genuinely cared about. The moment she had seen him in danger when the Namu grabbed him, she had dashed in to save him without thought. She was scarred by the thought, because of what it could imply. She knew a growing fondness was between them, but she feared how far it may go. Clean and well-rested she placed the thought aside and dressed herself in cloths prepared for the rest of the day's training. Much of the fourth day had been lost to her, but with Gran Torino gone she had the remainder of the night and three days of the work study left with Izuku. Warmth bubbled up in her at the thought, and she reveled in it. He had already learned a lot from her, but she would settle for nothing less than the best. When she entered the kitchen, she noticed Izuku was rather quiet and subdued. Normally he would ask her questions or talk about training. She remembered their short conversation from the train and wondered if it was still plaguing him. In her heart she knew he was right though he would need to overcome these thoughts and make his own decision. It was less common in the age they found themselves in, but he had encountered a villain with conviction. No, she couldn't just give him the answers. It might be easier, but he wouldn't be able to strengthen his own beliefs and resolve. The meal was passed in a silence that bothered her, a vein twitched lightly on her forehead and her foot was thumping under the table rapidly. Before she could burst from the unending silence Izuku stood from the table and washed his dishes in the sink. Anger was slightly under the surface as she believed he was ignoring her, but when he turned to her it disappeared. His eyes stared her down, and his back was straight, she found the sight sent a shiver down her back. In that moment the absolute confidence and assured belief in his next words made her see him as quite handsome. Izuku bent at a near 90 degrees as he bowed to her. I've decided, you were right I do need to be confident in my decisions and stop holding myself back. The hero killer made me realize what I was lacking, what he had, resolve and conviction. He was right about the current state of things, we do need a higher standard of heroes, but the way he went about it was wrong. That's why, as one of the best heroes I know, please, teach me everything you know his eyes alight with fire sent a shiver though her, Maruko's ached and a pleasant warmth settled in her core. She was staring at a new person, and deep down, she knew he would change the world, part of her wished she would see it from along his side. His three remaining days of study and training under Maruko had been utter hell on Izuku, but he wanted it no other way. Every time she knocked him down he stood back up and asked for more, he always said he needed to work twice as hard as others. She pushed him to his limits again and again, but it was up to Izuku to break past them. After his fight with the hero killer, Izuku knew he couldn't remain the same. The faster he mastered his powers and became as strong as possible the more he would be able to change what was wrong. His progress had exploded after he pushed himself beyond what he thought he could do his only limits were himself. Black Whip was the size of a regular rope and caused him no pain if he focused on the control, if he pushed it he could roughly double its thickness. He mainly used it as a support to grab things or increase his mobility, but it was incredibly versatile, and he tried more every day. Despite his best efforts and tips left by Gran Torino, he had made no progress on getting Float to activate for him. Izuku believed it could provide unequal help in all aspects of being a hero, but he couldn't make it activate. Everything he tried ended in failure, he had held his breath, jumped lightly and tried to halt his progress. He had even under Maruko's supervision jumped off the roof to try and force activate it, at the end he had caught himself with Black Whip before anything happened. It frustrated him to no end, but he also knew doing too much could hinder him. He felt his confidence strengthen with every failure though, it meant there was still more to learn and improve. His self-confidence improved every time Maruko gave him a compliment, even if small, like when she mentioned his improved cooking skill. After living so long with people telling him he wasn't good at anything and wouldn't amount to much, having someone believe in him helped greatly. All Might and others had complimented and believed in him, but whether it was his changed mindset or something about Maruko herself. Every time she complimented him he genuinely felt it and believed her every word. Izuku hadn't ever been short, he was after all average height, but all the increased diet and training helped immensely. Like when he had grown and buffed up from All Might's training, Maruko's had helped him just as much. He had grown a solid inch placing him comfortably at 5'6", and all his bulked muscle had been refined and defined. His strength had defiantly increased, along with his other base abilities, Maruko had made sure of that. But his muscles had gained their shape, All Might had made his body able to handle one for all by bulking it up as fast as possible. Maruko had taken what was there and chiseled it down. She had likened him to the old myth of Greek gods, he was large but incredibly defined. All the tempering and control over his workouts had increased his flexibility, and his leg muscles were well used. Before where his kicks had been linear and easy to spot, Maruko had spared with him repeatedly until he made his style complete. She had also mixed in various martial arts to teach him to fight properly, rather than wildly swing with all his strength behind each move. He had managed to increase his control over one for all to a constant 10%, he could briefly power up to either 15 or 20% for various moves without breaking his body. 
The increased power allowed him to fire small air bullets from his FS and kicks. Maruko had stated she was proud of his progress. Izuku realized something with greater clarity every time his confidence increased. He had feelings for Maruko. He wouldn't go as far as love, but he had no idea what to do with the realization. Several different thoughts had passed though him. The first was the difference in their age. He had gotten past that rather quick. The next one was what his mother or All Might would say. From there the reality of their positions came into question and he wondered what the world would think. What would happen if the number 7 pro hero started dating a high school UA? Hero in training. The final decision he came to after all thoughts settled was that it didn't matter. He wouldn't force it, nor would he run from it. Instead he would let his feelings go their own course. Izuku had no idea what Maruko thought of him along those veins, but he wanted to know, could they make something work? At first when the feelings had surfaced Izuku believed them to be nervousness and admiration, like what he had felt toward Yuraka. The longer they persisted however, he realized it didn't compare. His body reacted different and his heart raced far more. He wanted to be afraid of the feelings, but only because he knew that would be the easier answer. Nothing meant anything if Maruko didn't feel the same way he did, but no matter how hard he had tried he was unable to read her. He knew she was fond of him. The softness he caught in her eyes occasionally told him that, but if it extended past being her student he couldn't tell. Fear was the greatest thing that stopped him, he was completely and utterly afraid of what would happen. As the feelings were new to him he didn't know how to handle them. He felt as though he was slowly drowning in a room that continued to flood the larger his feelings grew. The harder he tried to set them aside or pretend they didn't exist the worse he felt the pain in his when Maruko did something that endeared her to him. They had just recently finished their final lunch together as Izuku prepared for a spar. She had told him it would be their final one to confirm his growth before he had to pack, and it was time to see him off to the train and back to his normal schooling. Izuku pumped himself up as much as he could, but he also felt a sadness settle in. Together they met in the training room and then began exchanging blows quickly without warning. He knew Maruko was keeping her level on par with him and could easily best him, but the spar was still going well in his opinion. She had defeated him every time, and he was determined to surprise her in some way at least once. Punches and kicks were traded in rapid succession, a brief lapse had been created and Izuku capitalized. He found his hands placed firmly on the ground supporting his weight as they entrapped Maruko's head between them. Their s pressed against one another as Maruko was on her back facing the ceiling. Izuku had her pin beneath him on the floor and only a foot separated their lips. Maruko, many other words wanted to cross his lips, but all he had managed was her name as they stared one another down. Neither moved as their bodies generated heat squished together. He was afraid to move or do anything. Izuku tried to read her eyes for any answer for what he really wanted to do, but they were blank. As though he was a snail Izuku moved down and intended to press their lips together in a tender. Call me Rumi. Her head was placed on his shoulder and her arms encompassed his upper back as she brought him into a hug. Izuku felt his world split into two very different directions. On one hand he felt they had moved forward and could be on a first name basis. His heart however, felt as though it was physically being ripped from his slowly. Then call me Izuku. He ignored the tears that slowly flowed and enjoyed her warmth before it was gone. Deep down he knew, he would go back to school and things would change. Part of him though had hoped that they could stay in that moment forever and nothing would change. Maruko had experienced and faced many things in her career as a hero, but the heavy silence of her final day with Izuku loomed over her head. They interacted like it was any other day as he prepped lunch for them, but there was a difference that weighed on her. She felt as though a physical weight of finality was looming on her shoulders in every action between them. Pride at what he had accomplished and become in the short week he had been under her was evident to her. Another deeper feeling lingered beneath the surface, but she carefully locked it up and threw away the key every time it made an emergence. She knew what it was deep down, but the implications of what it could cause were too deep. Rumi had very little, rather no experience, with her current substances, but she also knew she couldn't face them. A part of her questioned what would be so bad about acknowledging what she was feeling. After all they had both already shared far more with each other than they expected. The other half however ran away because she was afraid what it would mean if she did accept them. Fear of the unknown was a heavy burden to bear. Without any assurances that the feeling was mutual, she couldn't do it. Her meal was inhaled rather quickly in her haste to ignore the thoughts and feelings swirling around. She told Izuku they would have their final spar and he would show the results of his training under her. Maybe if we fight I can just put all this aside and settle it with my kicks. Mine made up Rumi locked everything down tight and stood opposite Izuku. She waited for him to charge her first, but they both waited for the other to make the first move. When neither moved, at the same unspoken moment they charged forward and met fist to fist. His strength even when boosted wasn't enough to push her back, but Maruko felt a definite pressure pushing against her fist. As best she could Maruko stated his level of abilities, but by equaling his power, she realized just how much he had grown. A few of his moves had caused her to dodge seriously lest she take the hit. She had limited him to his base one for all enhancement ability, but with how much he had improved Izuku's speed and power were not meant to be underestimated. His moves were far less linear than when he had arrived. Maruko was proud of all the well-aimed and powerful kicks sent towards her. She dodged, blocked, and countered every move he threw her way. It almost felt like he was getting messy, but she saw past it. A spin kick aimed for her shoulder was thrown with a sudden and frightful amount of speed as she ducked under it. 
She kicked from the ground and bounced around the room to get behind Izuku as they renewed a bout of fists and kicks at a higher intensity. He wasn't straining her, but Maruko felt a genuine sweat beginning to build as she exerted herself and put more effort into the fight. The fight lasted nearly 30 minutes, and neither had landed a decisive blow, but both sported a few bruises, and Izuku's lip was bleeding. When she came down particularly hard at a bad angle on one of her landings, a twinge of pain went up her leg. She pushed past the pain, but in the moment she had blinked away the pain Izuku had blurred far faster than ever before and swept her legs. Pain was expected, but when Maruko lightly hit the floor with her back she was busy instead looking at the wide green eyes a foot away from her. Pride welled up beneath the surface, but Maruko knew the warmth coming from her wasn't just from Izuku's body pinning hers down. Despite feeling slightly bitter at her loss, Rumi was rather uncomfortable with how comfortable she felt being so close to Izuku. His body was warm and hard against hers, but also soft and seemed to mold perfectly against her. Maruko, his voice had something unidentifiable in its tone, but it sent a bolt of lightning right through her. She knew at that moment staring deep into his green eyes what she wanted, but she also felt it wasn't hers for the taking. Her body betrayed her mind as her eyes closed and her arms wrapped around his upper back into a hug. Call me Rumi. There were so many other things she wanted to say, but she couldn't face what it would mean to accept them. She so desperately wanted to know what could be more, but her mind just wouldn't stop giving her doubts. I'm such a coward. Maruko enjoyed the warmth while she could before it ended, and they separated as Izuku stood up. He offered her a hand and she took it. When he asked if her ankle was okay she gave it a light roll. She had twisted it with the way she had landed, but there was no severe injury, as such she walked it off. For now, I don't have anything left to teach you, before you leave though go get me your hero costume. Izuku looked at her funny, but she told him to get it and then meet her at her office. He ran off to do as she asked while Rumi made her way slowly to her office as her was painfully constricted. Once he handed her the outfit she took it and told him to go pack his things as she worked on something. It was a little known fact, as not many people knew tiny details about her, but Rumi had many hobbies related to design. She took out a sewing kit along with a needle and thick yellow thread. By the time she had finished her work a well-sewn and unmistakable yellow crescent moon reminiscent of the one she worn on her costume was placed on Izuku's costume. It was only the size of a fist, not nearly as big as the one that covered her entire. Once Izuku wore it and was in costume however, the moon would be slightly off-center from his left pectoral, right where his heart was. Maruko tied off the thread and cut off the extra, she admired her work and the clenching pain in her was back. Izuku had changed her in the short week he had been there, she was glad to have experienced all the new things he had shown her. Deep down however, the moment she knew he would leave her dread had set into her every fiber and she slowly pushed him away. It was part of the reason she had run from the new feelings she experienced at every turn she was comfortable with things as they were. Anything that was new to her was something she had a deep feeling of needing to run from, she couldn't explain it, but she couldn't face what was new to her. When Izuku came to retrieve his costume, she was finished, and his bag was packed and ready to go. The sight of him ready to leave sent a painful bolt through her, but Maruko beat it down and presented his costume to him. Izuku took it and stared at the moon with reverence. He bowed and gave his thanks while he told her he would wear it with pride. True finality began to set in, Rumi wanted to say something before Izuku suddenly spoke up. If you're willing Mura Rumi, I could use your advice. There is a situation I have been avoiding and running away from for a while, but I know it's bound to resurface and soon. She listened as he recounted to her his tale of the wayward frenemy Katsuki Bekugo. From what he told her and the little she knew of the boy from the sport festival she agreed that it wouldn't be long before a confrontation was bound to happen between the two. Thoughts passed through her of what she could say to him, truthfully she had no answers. She had never had a personal dilemma along the same line that Izuku was facing. In any way she could she wanted to help, but no answer was clear. A stray moment of clarity hit her however, as a thought passed through her. I should just tell him what I wish I could tell myself. Maruko nodded her head before she looked at Izuku and passed on her thought. You aren't the same person you used to be you don't need to run from your problems. Face it head on and confront it first before it turns into something else. If you face him first, before he has the chance to face you the situation should resolve itself given time. Maruko was proud of her words, but they ate her up inside. I'm such a hypocrite, I can't face my own fears and problems and they are running away from me. A pang of guilt ate away at her, but she pushed it down. With her work done and the work study officially over Maruko walked with Izuku to the train station as they agreed. Neither said a word, and as Izuku boarded the train he stood before the doors and stared at her. She couldn't move, her feet were rooted to the spot, but she desperately wanted to do something, anything. Something within her longed to call out to him, to stop him, to do anything. Instead she watched as the doors closed and a pained look seemed to settle on his face, idly she wondered what hers looked like. With a whistle the train pulled away and a deep longing settled in her heart almost like a small hole had been left void and empty. A small ping reached her ears and she looked down to see her phone lit up. The number wasn't one she recognized right away, but once she did her heart thumped lightly as the void shrunk slightly. With everything that had happened, she had forgotten that she had given Izuku her personal number. I hope we keep in contact and thank you for the work study. It was far more than I could have ever hoped for and I can't express how grateful I am for everything you did for me. 
The message was short and brief, but the pain ebbed slightly as a smile graced her face and she texted back. Izuku passed his one day of recovery at home before school began in a bit of a daze. Lots had happened at his work study with Maruko, but the pain in his since their departure hadn't stopped its ache. The only time it faded was when his phone lit up with her name and a small smile graced his face. He found that even though they were only texts he could perfectly understand Rumi and what she was trying to say though her texts. Conversation flowed easily, and he realized they hadn't shared much other than things about being a hero during his work study. In the one day since he'd left he felt he knew her as an individual and friend more from her texts than what he'd learned while with her a whole week. They seemed to talk about anything and everything, but the conversations never grew dull or boring. His smile that lit up a room every time his phone went off hadn't gone unnoticed by his mother. When she asked him about it Izuku locked up for a moment before he recounted her advice. No more running right, if I can trust Rumi, I can trust my mom. Perhaps not everything right away since I don't want to make her nervous, but she is owed the truth. Izuku gave her a wide smile and brought her into a warm embrace. I have a lot I want to tell you mom, but the easiest place to start is that I've realized I have a crush on someone. He watched her eyes go wide as small patches of tears for her began to bubble up. Oh, my baby boy is growing up, I'm so happy. Is it that you're a rocket girl you're friends with, you talk about her a lot, she sounds like a nice young lady. Izuku released a chuckle and rubbed the back of his head in what he realized was a nervous habit. Maruko had greatly strengthened his self-confidence, but some things stuck. No, it's actually the hero I had my work study under, Rabbit Hero Maruko. The confession had come out easy, and the verbal acknowledgement of his feelings made him feel lighter. He looked down to his mother, and she seemed frozen in thought. She seemed to be thinking on what he said as it processed. That's, that's not what I was expecting. Izuku felt her arms tighten around him as she hugged harder and looked at him with pride. I'm still happy for you Izuku, you're growing up and experiencing so many new things. If you're happy then it's just like I already told you, I will fully support you, just promise me again you won't make me worry. Izuku was glad for her approval, but what she asked of him was difficult. I will continue to do my best not to worry you, I've already moved past the breaking my bones part, but you might want to sit down. He gently released his mother from their hug and took a deep breath. All Might told me he believes in me and trusts my judgment I don't want her to be in any danger, but she has a right to know and not worry. Not everything about all for one, but no more lies are covering. His resolve steeled itself and he placed a comforting hand on Inko's as she looked at him with worry. It's time I told you the truth mom, the truth about me and All Might. About what it means to carry my quirk and how I suddenly developed it, my quirk's true name is one for all. With no place better than the beginning Izuku jumped into the deep end. And Ko had lots of questions for Izuku, but despite how he believed she would react, she had remained mostly silent and listened. When things she didn't understand surfaced she would pause briefly, and he would answer her. After everything was over she had stayed silent before a teary smile spread deep over her face. I'm worried and nervous, but you must be incredibly happy. Your number one idol believed in you and even gave you his power. I'll always worry, that's a mother's job, but I meant what I said. With everything I have I will support you, and you chase your dream Izuku. He had broken into tears along with his mother, and they had shared a long-needed hug. She had brought up old wounds from the past when she tried to apologize for the words she had said so long ago. Izuku only told her he had long forgiven her and hugged tighter as the distance between them for so long over his quirklessness was finally closed. Together they had made dinner as Izuku asked her to teach him a few of her recipes. He had grown rather fond of the skill after Maruko had him cook all the meals, and he was eager to learn more. After they had passed dinner and washed all dishes Izuku lifted some weights and exercised his muscles as he pondered how he would confront Katsuki tomorrow. His phone buzzed from his side. When he saw Rumi's name pop up a smile came to him as he looked to see her message. It was short and brief, but it sent a feeling of dread coursing through him as he remembered the incident when the hero killer ingested his. You mentioned the ability of your quirk to be passed on. Is it only by choice what if I stole some of your DNA and ate it? Would OFA transfer to me the question hit him hard and he found himself standing straight as he wrung all might without a thought. It's a bit late young Midoriya something his words were cut off as Izuku spoke raid fire. All might the hero killer ate my, does he suddenly have one for all? Rumi had the thought in passing. But then I thought about it and now I'm freaking out, I feel like I failed you. He continued and rambled before All Might shouted at him to stop his nonsense and calm down. I heard the basics from Gran Torino, and I defiantly want to see this black whip and any other progress you've made. Truth be told I thought you would have already asked him about that though. Yes, one for all does have the ability to be transferred, but it's all in accordance with the wielder's will. A simple version if you will, is that one for all can be forcefully given to another, but it cannot be forcefully taken, that's why it's the ultimate weapon against all for one. He went a bit deeper for Izuku on the matter. With his fears quelled and curiosity peaked Izuku asked a few more questions before he promised to see All Might tomorrow. His crisis averted Izuku shot a quick answer to Rumi before he told her he would talk again tomorrow and was headed for his bed to get sleep. He woke with slight trepidation for the day to come, but Maruko had gifted him with her words and confidence. His train ride to school was still filled with people that recognized him from the festival, and it brought a small smile to his face. Even if it was only a few people here and there it was nice to feel some recognition for his efforts and work. 
He passed several students on his way to class, but he was still rather early. Some of his fellow students greeted him, and others watched as he walked by, as though they could feel a difference in him from the festival. He saw Shinso in a hallway and tossed him a friendly smile that was reciprocated with a small smile and nod of acknowledgement. Finally, his class door came into view and the feeling of hesitation came back. He opened the door and a few of his classmates were already there. Most discussion was about the work studies, but they all looked at him when he entered the door. Normally he would have shrunk a bit, but he was no longer his old self. Kirishima and Kaminari were making fun of Bakugo's hair, and Tenya and Shoto were together in the back. Izuku was quickly approached by his various friends and asked about his work study, but he lightly greeted them and said he would tell them later. He walked forward with purpose and placed his hand on Katsuki's shoulder. His hair that he was complaining about being stuck in a flattened state popped out with an explosion and a curled lip greeted him. We need to talk. The glare was ignored, and he pushed down his old fears, he wasn't the same anymore. Either they would restore what they once held as old childhood friends, or something new would come about. Whatever the result may be Izuku was done running it was time to confront his problems. Whatever conversations may have been held were silenced as the two boys stared one another down. They were silent as Bakugo brushed Izuku's hand off his shoulder and stood taller, if only by a few inches. Izuku had expected outrage or anger, and while it was there, he also noticed Katsuki was still rather subdued. Let's go, Katsuki said over his shoulder. He was quick to follow him and finish their discussion before class began in 15 minutes. Once they were outside the classroom Katsuki continued to walk until he stopped in a secluded hallway. They faced one another and stood in silence until Bakugo raised his voice. Speak, he said. Izuku took that as his cue and released his breath while he stood tall. I already told you this, but I'll say it again. Everything I said about not competing with you, I take it back. I'm done hiding in your shadow and cowering. We are both aiming to be the best hero. From now on we are equals and rivals, I'll defeat you with my power. The anger he expected was finally there in full force. Damn it you stupid nerd, you were a pebble on my path. How the hell am I supposed to destroy you when you already won? Izuku looked in shock at that. Kaken, where are you? He was interrupted. Shut up shit, shit shit shit, where did I go wrong? The best hero is never supposed to lose, he always wins, so how did I lose to you? You damn Deku a deep breath passed through Izuku. He needed to keep his cool and talk his way through this with Bakugo if they ever wanted closure. Have I ever told you my image of victory? It's you Kaken. Ever since we were young I've always looked up to you. I don't know how or when you got the notion I was looking down on you, but I wasn't. For the longest time I admired everything about you, I wanted to be just like you. His words came out in a calm and cold truth that hung in the air. Bakugo looked near on the verge of tears while he slumped. Then where did I go wrong? If I was so much better than you, why did I lose? Was my ideal wrong? The best hero should always win, no matter the odds. Shouldn't he Izuku could feel the pain in his gaze as they bleed their feelings towards each other for the first time ever. You weren't wrong, and I don't think I was right either. I've seen and had a lot of different mentalities thrown at me recently. What I learned is that you need power and resolve to back your beliefs. But if I were to symbolize the hero that saves everyone, and you the hero who always wins, then why can't we be both together? We can both be the best heroes who always win and rescue everyone. I don't want to fight you anymore Kaken, I want to be like we once were. Before pride, before arrogance, before ideals, can't we just be friends both working together towards our goals rivals that will push each other to be better and always try our best Izuku bared his heart with his final push to reclaim his friend. Katsuki was deathly silent as he took everything in. He had thought and been stuck on this same issue for so long that he didn't know how to let it go. There truthfully wasn't a reason against what Izuku was saying. Katsuki grunted as he thought of something similar that best genist had also said to him. One thing was still unresolved though. What about that borrowed power you lied to me about? Izuku took in a sharp breath, but very subtly so he didn't alert Katsuki. He knew it would eventually come up at one point he might have even told him. As he was now though, Izuku had a support group and someone he trusted deeply and had already shared his secret with. Truthfully, that was how I felt, I didn't know what else to say without you feeling I had lied to you. With more time to study and learn how my quirk works however, I don't feel like that anymore. I told you my power, was borrowed and someone else had given me my power because it was true to me. Shortly after that encounter we had with the sludge villain, I met an injured hero. He had seen me rush into the situation and told me that was the true spirit of a hero that he was looking for. As a retired hero, he had been delegated as a personal trainer when I told him of my dream to enter UA. Despite being quirkless he was inspired. With his knowledge he trained me to be as physically able to handle the exam as I could be. It was during that time that my quirk awakened, the doctors believed I was quirkless, but I wasn't. Since I had never heavily worked out before my body wasn't strong enough to handle my quirk, it was protecting itself. Once my quirk awakened, I initially thought it was a strength enhancer, so I fired it off at full power all the time and broke my bones. Now that I've had time to work with it though I've learned what it really is. My body produces an energy that I can direct to interact with my body in diverse ways. Truthfully I am blessed, what is only one quirk seems like many because of its unique ability. I didn't believe I was worthy of that power and felt like it had been given to me by my trainer. You've had your whole life to learn what I'm just now putting into practice. So, I'll continue to grow and get stronger, I'd like to do that with my friend at my side. 
Can we go back to how things used to be Kakan? Can we be friends again? Izuku knew the story wasn't the full truth, but enough was blended in to come off as earnest. The last bit would also allow him to cover his other quirks granted from one for all. After all this time you can at least pronounce my name properly, can't you Izuku? It was a short sentence, but it held so much weight behind it. He grinned as Bakugo slowly raised his fist and held it out to Izuku with a small smile on his face. The gesture was reciprocated and Izuku lightly bumped fists with him as they grinned at one another. It's nice to have my friend back Katsuki, he said. Bakugo grunted as he smirked and headed back to the classroom throwing insults back at him. The weight and snark they used to hold was gone though. Instead it was the light banter of two old friends messing with one another as they went about teasing one another. Their classroom came up quick as they entered together with similas on their faces. The other students were utterly stunned and didn't know how to react as they entered. Izuku headed toward his seat with a wide smile as he listened to them speak in what they thought was whispers. What happened to them he noticed that came from Gyro as she talked to Momo. Yuraka gave a light fist pump as her eyes heated up. The faded battle of rivals. Asui looked at her with an inquisitive head tilt. But they aren't fighting anymore Ochako. Her point seemed to be ignored. The faded battle of rivals. The class continued their conversations as Izuku made his way to talk with Tenya and Shoto before the class began. Both greeted him with a small smile as they talked in whispers about their battle. I wanted to tell you both the good news once we were back. My brother is finally being released from the hospital, also he won't be able to resume his hero duties, but feeling has come back slowly to his legs. The best guess right now is that he won't ever have full mobility back, but my brother may one day walk again. Tenya had a bright smile as he relayed the news. Their conversation had been overheard as the whole class was paying attention to them. A difference had been noted in the subtle aura the three gave off, whether they knew it or not, each held themselves just a bit taller. I can't believe you are all enjoying the time you had, women are demons hiding their true colors I tell you. Minda was mostly ignored as people crowded around Izuku. Still I can't believe you guys fought the hero killer, I heard on the news that you were saved by Maruko. You spent your week under her right Deku, that must have been scary. Izuku smiled at Yuraka and noticed a red tint came to her as he chuckled and rubbed the back of his head. Normally he would have stuttered and turned away, but after he realized what he felt for her was his admiration of his same dream he found it easy to talk with her. Truthfully I had a wonderful time, I learned a lot from Rumi. She taught me a whole bunch of stuff about what it means to be a hero. He noticed a look of shock passed over the class and Achako seemed to have been struck. Rumi, what exactly happened while you were there? Denki asked as he got in Izuku's face with an accusatory glare. Mina seemed to have lost his earlier tension of women as he suddenly drooled in front of Izuku. Did some sort of affair occur between master and student were her tits huge? I bet she ruined you. Normal girls just won't do it anymore, will they? You need to have a mature woman. You damn player, I bet a slap of Tsuyu's tongue rang out. But eyes didn't leave Izuku as he only laughed and continued to rub his head. Several eyes raised at his lack of blush, stutter, or denial of the situation. Nothing like what you said happened, I just grew up. We have similar pasts, and became fast friends, that's all. She asked me to call her Rumi, so I do, she does have a heroic figure though. Izuku whispered the last bit to himself, but it still brought a pleasant heat to his cheeks. The continued grilling of the different work studies would have continued, but the door slid open and they all rushed to their seats as Aizawa entered. Class proceeded quickly as Aizawa directed the class on what their new goals would be as finals were approaching. His section of the day passed quickly as Izuku took notes and thought over the progress he'd made. Rumi's advice had pointed him in the right direction, it was slow right now, but he had restored his friendship with Katsuki. The rapid pace continued as Izuku grabbed his costume as he and the class had been told. Once they were dressed they were to head over to Ground Beta for a special hero class with All Might. After everyone was dressed in a quick bus ride filled with idle chat they arrived at the grounds. Izuku noticed that his class was giving him odd looks whenever he answered them and conversed, but he put it to the side. With All Might before him Izuku noticed for the first time that his admiration was still there, but it felt less clouded. He felt as though he was seeing All Might for the first time not as the unreachable symbol of peace, but as mentor and teacher. All Might gave them a rundown on the exercise they would be facing as their first test back from the work studies. He along with four others would start at equal distances apart and race towards the center of the arena. Their goal was to rescue a distressed citizen in the form of All Might. While he got into his position he briefly heard the rest of the class talking about who would win. It's got to be Ciro, he's got the best quirk and mobility for the exercise. They debated back and forth as the race was almost ready. What about Mina and Ajiro? You can't count out the mobility of their quirks either. Ida is an excellent choice too, but he's still injured right as the conversation heated up. Katsuki had a sudden urge to defend Izuku after so long of putting him down. Don't count Izuku out, he said he had a major development with his quirk. The other students and even Aizawa turned at that interested. Normally Aizawa would have left the class alone to All Might and reviewed the footage later. As the finals were coming up and they were fresh back from work studies, he wanted to see their progress with his own eyes. Everyone had a question on the tip of their tongue they wanted to ask. Regardless of what they wanted to ask however, Katsuki didn't know more as that was all Izuku had told him. 
before the questions could start though a loud siren-like noise rang out as all might called over the speakers. Start they all turned to the monitor with interest for what would be displayed. Unless the situation calls for it I should try to keep Black Whip under wraps. At the same time though, the definition I gave to Katsuki for my quirk works in my favor. I should get used to using everything I have at my disposal while around my allies. Start at 5% and adjust to the situation. Plan in mind Izuku shot up towards the roofs of the buildings the second the signal was given. He shot himself off various surfaces and bounced to the roofs while observing his surroundings. There were lots of slippery surfaces and small pipes he could easily lose footing on, but he had practiced with Rumi about how to best maneuver around. Seeing nothing that he deemed an obstacle, Izuku raised his power to 10% as green electricity surged up. He shot off at double his speed while increasing the fair lead he already had. As he looked around to determine where all might and thus the goal where they came into sight, Izuku saw a pipe in front of him angled just right for his plan and purposely slipped off it. With his angle and speed from falling calculated he attached Black Whip to the pipe and slingshot himself straight to the finish. As he landed he went to reach for the goal before he stopped. When he looked around he noticed All Might was inside a Cedo cube that appeared to be made of glass. Around Izuku's feet he noticed five separate small indents that looked like pressure plates. He moved away from the glass and stepped onto the plate as he did a small green light flashed around it. Understanding the general concept behind what was happening, he stood his place on the plate and awaited his fellow classmates arrival. When they showed up one by one they first shot him questions one after another before he directed them to step on a plate of their own and wait. After everyone arrived and all plates were stepped on the glass around All Might let out a sound and dropped open around all of them. Well done heroes, this is a good lesson. It's true you must each grow and use your own strengths. But don't forget true heroes work with those around them to complete a common goal. All Might smirked and gave a thumbs up to his students and told them to rest while he called the next set. With the others gone he whispered under his breath to Izuku. Hardly recognized you there young Midoriya. Keep up the excellent work, I can see you are progressing fast. Izuku took the words with pride as he walked off with his classmates. They bombarded him with questions, but he was happy to answer, the way he used to feel around them lifted and they were all on equal footing as hero hopefuls. He always placed more weight on his shoulders than he realized, but with his increased confidence it lifted more with each day. The class was finished in rapid fashion and Izuku returned to his homeroom as he went over his new abilities. They were all wildly impressed with his change in demeanor as well as his growth. Mina made another comment that was ignored, but his words did put the focus on the in plain view crescent moon proudly displayed on Izuku's. He took immense pride in the symbol he was granted to wear and ran a hand over it. With the day mostly over and classes finished Aizawa told them to study for all the finals tests they would receive. They discussed amongst each other about what subjects they were ahead on and which one others needed help on. Momo offered a group study to help those who wanted her help. Izuku quickly interjected and asked if she had enough room to host the whole class. She broke into a delighted cheer and held her fists in front of her as she exclaimed that she did. Izuku then suggested they could hold a class-wide study session and any questions that individuals had could be answered in groups. That would allow everyone to work together, but also break into groups based on the subject they would need help with. Everyone agreed to the idea despite a few grumbles from Bakugo. With everyone in agreement together various days and times were set to met at Momo's house for their study sessions. Having a different outlook from his battle with the hero killer offered Izuku a clearer vision of his classmates. Not counting Mina since he didn't really understand him, Izuku could tell they were all on their way to being great heroes. Each of them however, himself included, had things they needed to work on. The only one he could try and help at the given time that he noticed was Momo. Despite her large intelligence, he had noticed her confidence from the beginning of the year had dropped. Nezu silently sat in his office as he watched the footage from Class 1AS Hero Training. He was glad to see the improvement even if gradual in all the students, but his eyes focused on Izuku. Slightly mad cackles escaped from him as he drank some tea and watched the clip finish off. I withheld all the offers from the sports festival for Izuku since I believed Gran Torino would reach out, and he did. But to think he would also receive an offer from Maruko, I didn't expect that. Seems it was an excellent choice to send her offer though, he has vastly improved in the small amount of time he was with her. Nezu chuckled silently to himself. He lightly closed the laptop playing the footage and looked back to the papers on his desk. The one he glanced at for several moments before brushing to the side was lightly labeled at the top, dormitories. Nezu knew it wasn't quite time for that idea yet and instead focused on the other things right in front of him before a knock came to his door. Enter. A member of his staff told him it was time for his scheduled meeting. He hopped down from his chair and headed towards the room. Once he entered Aizawa took center focus and control as he proposed his updated and planned changes to the finals tests. Nezu agreed that with the villains becoming more focused and bold a change was needed. Maruko felt her days were passing quickly in a tunneled void. She thought once Izuku left, things would finally go back to normal, and they had. Only she wasn't the same anymore even if her days were. Her ached every time she thought of him and it only lessened when she sent or received texts from him. The days were a blur because she realized that with Izuku gone she had seemingly become numb to everything around her. It didn't interfere with her work, but she found it harder to smile honestly as Himuri had pointed out to her. 
she found herself once more slipping fully back into the persona of Maruko, the rough and tough hero. That was her, but deep down it also wasn't. With Izuku gone she found that she wanted to do more things she would normally consider girly. Before she hadn't put much overall thought into her outward appearance, but she had found herself wondering what she would look like in a dress. Each time a thought came up though she realized that it was a question she wanted Izuku's answer to. Yes, she was curious if she would look good in a dress, but she was more interested in whether Izuku would think she looked good. Every time one of those thoughts passed her she would grow a tint of red to her cheeks and her would clench. She knew that her thoughts on the larger matter couldn't be ignored forever and instead had turned to her trusted friend Himari. What's wrong with me Mary? I need your help. Rumi had broken down and explained every situation she had encountered with Izuku and what she had felt after each. Then she had even gone into her recent thoughts and what they meant while asking why she cared so much about one person. Himari had given her a slight look of pity before she huffed and answered. I believe you need to come to your own conclusion about these feelings. However, in my experience whether you want to accept it or not, when you have these thoughts and experiences it points to one thing. Not being able to think about anyone else and only wanting to be around Izuku more to spend time with him, it sounds like you are in love Rumi. Everything else around her crashed into black. After she had heard that word from Himari, Rumi had become almost robotic in all her efforts. She tried to deny how light the word had made her feel, but every time she thought of it the first image that came to her was Izuku and his bright green eyes. Acceptance was a slow and hard-fought battle, but once she caved into the feeling the hole in her shrunk until it was instead filed with a large warmth that bubbled up. Even with the revelation and acceptance, she thought back on her actions and realized she had two major flaws stopping her. The first being spending time with Izuku, they had almost no way to spend time with each other without going completely out of their way to see one another. She would have been happy to do that however, Izuku not only had his schooling, but without knowing if he felt even remotely like her he might not respond the same. Her second and to her truly glaring issue was her own self-doubts. Rumi had inadvertently pushed Izuku away on his final work-study day because she realized she had a fear of abandonment. It wasn't her parents' fault they had passed, but by leaving her alone at such an early age with all that responsibility jaded her. Deeper still was her jealous tendencies. Before she had pushed Izuku away she had tried to hold him as close as possible and make him hers. Even if subconsciously she didn't want him to belong to anyone else. That was why she had ripped off his all-might ears on his costume and branded it with her own mark. In a way it was her only way to claim what she believed was hers. She knew that wasn't right and Izuku didn't belong to anyone, but she wanted him to be hers and no one else's. It was rooted into her fears, and she knew that, but she still wanted him. When she heard her phone ping her thoughts immediately went to Izuku and a smile appeared. Her eyes came across the screen however, as it wasn't Izuku's name her smile gradually slid down. She opened and read the message as an eyebrow raised. By the time she finished a smile was back on her face, but it was also filled with anticipation. This time for sure I won't hold back. A large and happy smile came as she held her and awaited her coming future. Nezu was impressed with how well Aizawa and Vlad had watched their students and followed their growth. He agreed with the pairs and teachers that would best fit each pair. The meeting passed quickly for him as he analyzed each possible scenario and the best location for each pair to face their trial. When it finally came to an end he made to head for his office before All Might called out to him. Having something that he wished to discuss with Nezu he asked to have a minute of his time. He agreed and told All Might to follow him to his office. They arrived quickly and he offered a cup of tea as he asked All Might again how he was adjusting to being a teacher. I'm sure you must have been quite proud of Izuku, I watched his footage. Though I must admit I wanted to speak with you as well. We both know what one for all does, does Midori actually possess another quirk he asked his question with positive glee and anticipation. All Might went on to then describe what he had learned from Izuku in their few brief conversations. Nezu took it all in and let his quirk calmly sort all the information and create several hypotheses. After a few moments he nodded his head in silent thought. It is a one-of-a-kind quirk, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised that it's evolving after such an amount of time and power has passed through it. He mumbled lightly before mad cackles again came loose as he thought of all the possibilities. You mentioned you've started compiling a book of the previous users. If I can help I will, however, Izuku has already used this new ability. Black Whip was it he used the ability in full display of his class, as he prepared an adequate cover for their questions. All Might reiterated what Izuku had said, and the mouse, bear, dog, agreed it was a solid diversion. Enough truth was blended with falsehood to cover him. Initially you came here for something else didn't you what can I be of assistance and All Might Nezu posed his question and All Might took a breath. I wanted to share with you what Izuku shared with me. The circle of people who know about One for All has increased by two. He didn't mention anything of All for One to his mother, but he did share his quirk origin with her. All Might coughed lightly and wiped away the slight that came up. Nezu offered more tea as he gratefully drank it. The real reason I came here though, I definitely trust Izuku and it's his secret to share now. What you should know however, is that he shared our secret together, everything about One for All and my injury with his work-study hero. Rumi Yusujiyama better known as Rabbit Hero Maruko knows everything of One for All. Nezu took a small sip of his tea as he processed that news. Certainly, I believed it would be interesting for him to study under Maruko, I never believed he would take the offer though. 
neither did I believe she would send one, truly a unique situation I have found myself in. I'm always pleased to know things can still surprise me in this world, foo foo. This could very well play into the worries that have been rising recently. My oh my, so many interesting ideas are coming to me with this development. I have so many fun schemes that could be played out to a T. Nezu broke into full cackles as he went into overdrive with thoughts of several ways he could use the information. After he calmed down and verified All Might needed nothing else he dismissed him to be on his way to prep for the next day's classes. He thumbed through some old don'ts he had already filed away for the sports festival and retrieved the one he was looking for. Once he had it a gleam came to his eyes and he took out his phone. The message he wanted was quickly typed and sent away as he chuckled to himself.